everyone and his dog has an attachment style nowadays. It could be secure attachment, avoidant attachment, or any one of a set of four types of attachments. But the truth is that some people have what I call flat attachment. They are incapable of any kind of bonding, any kind of relatedness to other people at all. Flat attachers, people with flat attachment, regard other people as utterly interchangeable, replaceable, dispensable. Objects, functions, nothing more. They commodify people. They treat them as commodities. Like grains of rice, all people look the same to them. When a relationship is over, people go through a period that I call latency. It's a period where people mourn the defunct bond. People, members of the couple, members of the diet, process the grief, experience withdrawal symptoms associated with the breakup. But not so the flat attacher. Someone with a flat attachment transitions instantaneously, smoothly, abruptly, and seamlessly from one insignificant other to the next insignificant target. People with flat attachments fully substitute a newfound beau, lover, mate, or so-called intimate partner for the one they had discarded. The one whose usefulness has expired, for whatever reason. As you have already surmised, many narcissists, and almost all psychopaths, are flat attachments. They have flat attachment. Long time ago, when the dinosaurs roamed the earth, 1995, I coined the phrase, idealized devalue and discard. It is rare for me to admit an error, but I did commit it. I should have rather said, idealize, devalue, discard, and replace. Replace, that's the key word. You see, attachment, of course, has to do with intimacy. And here's the time to say that my name is Sam Vaknin, and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, a host of other books about personality disorders. Attachment has to do with intimacy, past intimacy, and future intimacy. Attachment is forged in early childhood through relationships with primary caregivers and primary objects, also known as parents. Attachment determines one's ability to engage in intimacy, to create and participate in intimate relationships. But to some people, intimacy is like kryptonite, both, both sought after and dreaded and feared. The result is an intricate and crazy-making dance dubbed approach avoidance repetition compulsion. Another aspect of this ambivalence, this love towards intimacy and hatred of intimacy, another aspect is what I call the menu scraps dichotomy. Those who truly seek intimacy want the entire menu of interpersonal togetherness. They want intensive talking, they want romanticized sex, they want it all. But the intimacy challenged, the people with flat attachment, make do and are fully satisfied with scraps. They feel threatened and overwhelmed by the totality of the intimacy menu. They want to just taste, have a taste of things. They don't want the main dishes. They get by on occasional snippets of talk, on rare sex and on swaths of personal space and time apart. The two types of people the intimacy challenge and those who seek intimacy, the intimacy start. They are utterly incompatible. 
They make each other profoundly unhappy. And yet, oddly, they, they are inexorably attracted and drawn to each other. The menu types are parental fixes by nature. And the scraps crave the unbridled and unconditional intimacy preferred by their antithesis, by the menu people. They dread the intimacy, but they still seek it. Mixed couples, flat attaches and deep attaches. Mixed couples invariably end up in a mushroom cloud of agonizing mayhem and unmitigated catastrophe. They may drive each other to insanity, or even to suicidal ideation, or actual suicide. At the very least, they subject each other, one another, to excruciating pain, as the menu tries to alter and modify the scraps, and the scraps withdraws further and further, and resorts to desperate measures, such as cheating or reckless behaviors, in order to undo the bond and revert to pristine loneliness. When rejected or abused, women, for example, overeat or abuse substances. And that's a perfect example where flat attachment leads to outlandish and extreme outcomes. Because as I said, most women would overeat or abuse substances. But a minority of women self-medicate with men. They hook up with friends, former flames, or even total strangers for some good time, for some sex, casual sex. It helps them to restore their self-esteem, regulate or dull their negative emotions, buttress their femininity, stabilize their labile sense of self-worth. Intimacy, however, is a different issue. Never mind how transient, limited, or fake, even if merely physical, it does wonders to the assertiveness and resilience of such women, the flat attaches. In some cases, such conduct involves defiant, in-your-face, rage-infused cheating on the intimate partner. And so that's an example of how flat attaches react to the stresses of typical relationships. But such misconduct has three other goals. First of all, to hurt to cause excruciating pain, to grievously and often publicly offend and humiliate the rejecting or abusive counterparty, or the counterparty that it is perceived as rejecting and abusive. Because flat attachers, being narcissists and psychopaths, or histrionic, are very often hypervigilant. They find insults and humiliation when there's none or none intended. The second reason for such behavior is to elicit a reaction, any reaction, from the indifferent and, sub and dismissive spouse or mate. And this is usually done via ostentatious triangulation. And the third reason is to win points in a never-ending power play of one-upmanship and brinkmanship between the misbehaving woman and the husband, her date or boyfriend. The flat attached women, the, the women with flat attachment, who default to this kind of choice, are able to engage in emotionless and casual sex. They are often histrionic. Today we think of histrionic personality disorder as the female variant of psychopathy. That's the latest thinking in the field. These women lack impulse control. They suffer from emotional dysregulation, which is also common among borderlines, trauma victims with PTSD or extreme complex PTSD, CPTSD. And of course, when I talk about women, it's an example of a flat attachment that is somewhat sexist. Because this equally applies to histrionic men. Only the number of histrionic men is much, is, is much smaller than the number of histrionic women. So this particular example applies much more to women than to men. But men undermine, sabotage intimacy in other ways, for example, by being passive-aggressive, or by being outright aggressive, or by uh, conspicuously cheating, or in many other ways. Flat attaches, regardless of gender, male or female, 
men and women, being incapable of attachment feel threatened by it. Intimacy within a relationship is perceived as a trap, as imprisonment, as being put in shackles. So to free themselves from this perception of being a hostage or a prisoner, these people would do anything. They would do, use nuclear weapons. They would soul murder others. They would hurt, they would offend, they would do anything. The extremes to which flat attachers are willing to go in order to free themselves from intimacy, these extremes are absolutely mind-boggling. The things I've seen and the things I've experienced defy description. Flat attachment is fast becoming a global social problem. With technologies such as dating apps, with social pressures, cultural pressures, disintegration of institutions such as family and community, people become atomized, alienated, isolated. The incentive to become a flat attacher increases. The rewards for being a flat attacher are on the rise. And as Skinner taught us in behaviorism, rewards dictate performance, dictate behavior patterns. We are all becoming more and more uh, incapable of true attachment. We are all in a way becoming flat attachers. And in this particular sense at least, we are all becoming more and more narcissistic and even more and more psychopathic. Shalom, Bavazonim Hamudim Shili. Look it up. Society keeps telling you if you're not having sex, especially casual sex, something is wrong with you. If you don't if you're not in a relationship, every single day of every single week, something is definitely wrong with you. And if you are incapable of intimacy, then you are lacking a basic constituents of what it means to be human. These are society's messages. Society wants you to conform. Society wants you to be a herd animal. And yet studies and surveys like the Pew Center surveys consistently show that anywhere between one third and one half of adults don't feel comfortable in relationships. They're not happy. They're not content, they're egodystonic, they want out and they undermine and sabotage relationships when they find themselves in them. So today we are going to discuss a new spin, on a or relatively new spin, on attachment theory. Not the classical thing, you know, secure, insecure, attachment styles. I've, I've done, there's a video I've made about these issues and you can watch it separately. But today I'm going to discuss an attachment theory, which is actually the recent iteration of attachment theory, which deals with danger, and more specifically, danger in relationships, and how do we survive um, such dangers. My name is Sam Vaknin, and apropos danger, I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, and I'm a danger to all future generations, because I'm a professor of psychology and I mold the next generations of psychologists and psychiatrists in several countries. How is that for danger? Okay, Shoshanim, let's delve right in and start with the fact that not everyone is built to be in a relationship. I'm going to repeat this sentence and I want you to listen to it well because many of you are going to feel a wave of relief wash over you. Not everyone is built to be in a relationship. It's okay if you are not in a relationship. It's okay if you don't want relationships. It's okay if you don't want intimacy. It's okay if you want to be celibate. And it's okay if you want to have casual sex, as long as you don't cheat yourself, you don't deceive yourself about the nature of what it is that you're doing. There are different attachment styles. 
and insecure attachment styles predict recurrent relationship failure. So why go there? And no, attachment styles cannot be changed. They are ingrained patterns of relating to other people. And they usually emerge in late childhood and, and early adolescence. It is possible in theory to modify some behaviors attendant upon attachment styles, but you can't change the basic attachment styles. Your, your basic attachment style. I'm sorry, this is the fact. So if you are one of the several uh, types of insecurely attached people, then relationships, intimacy, love, proximity, cohabitation, marriage, family, these are not for you. Don't go there. You're going to make yourself miserable and you're going to make everyone around you miserable. Why? Just because society tells you to? You don't have intimacy skills. You don't have relationship skills because you did not want to acquire them. And why you did not want to acquire them is the topic of today's video. But the fact is you lack these skills, the ability to compromise, the ability to, to, to negotiate, setting boundaries, sharing, keeping separation, individuation, even as even when you are in a couple, avoiding merger and fusion and numerous other skills, without which intimacy and relationships become traps. The other person becomes your personal hell. Across multiple studies, at least 15%, that's one five percent that's one of seven adults state that they are much more comfortable, much happier, much more content, much more satisfied being alone. They like to be alone. There's a whole subgroup of schizoids and schizoid-like personalities. Lynn Sperry described the schizoid uh, personality. There are, of course, people with mental health disorders, for example, schizoid personality disorder, paranoid personality disorder, obsessive compulsive personality disorder. And these personality disorders and other mental health issues such as bipolar disorder and so on preclude functional relationships. If we put all of these together, there's about 15% who would rather be alone. 31% of adults are lifelong singles. One third of adults spend their entire life being single. This has always been the case, by the way. In the Victorian era, this these women were called spinsters and their male equivalents were called eternal bachelors. And then much later in the 70s, there was the Peter Pan syndrome. People who refused to grow up and assume adult chores and responsibility and adult roles in society. This was castigated as a form of infantilism. The majority of the rest of the people, the other two thirds, they are immured, literally entombed, in abusive, dead, or ephemeral pseudo-relationships. Only a minority, actually, only a minority survive within functional relationships, which provide a modicum of happiness and allow for self-growth and self-development. These are the minority of relationships. The majority of relationships are what we call pseudo-relationships. They look like relationships, some of these relationships last for decades, and yet they are not relationships in any clear sense of the word. They are um, dysfunctional, they're dead, they are abusive, there's no recognition or respect for boundaries, they include merger and fusion, or exactly the opposite, aversion and avoidance and withdrawal. That's where the majority of, of people are. And that's the reason the divorce rate is something like 40-50% of all, of all marriages, of all first marriages, and 60-70% of second and third marriages. Intimacy and love, anyhow, are lost arts. They are the outliers. They're no longer the norm. <laughs> Add to that personal predilections and proclivities, and it's a miracle that anyone ends up with anyone else. The problem is that some people feel threatened or they feel constrained, suffocated. 
uh, by love and intimacy in longer committed relationships. They don't feel good in when, when there's commitment. These kind of people anticipate failure, hurt, misery, and discord. And so they develop anticipatory anxiety. They know it's going to end badly. And so they geared themselves and, and prepare themselves for the ineluctable uh, Armageddon. Armageddon catastrophe. They catastrophize. They preemptively is an anxiolytic strategy, an anxiety reducing strategy. They preemptively bring about the very outcomes of which they are terrified. They repeatedly adopt dysfunctional behaviors. It's like these people are saying, let the other shoe drop. I can't bear it anymore. If anything bad is going to happen, it's going to happen. Let it happen now. And I'm going, to, I'm going to make sure that it does happen. I'm going to provoke my partner. I'm going to cheat uh, on my partner. I'm going to misbehave. I'm going to avoid my partner. I'm going to develop an addiction. There are numerous strategies to destroy and sabotage and undermine a relationship. These are relationship misfits. They, these people can't have intimacy, relationships, and love. They crave, more than anything in the world, they crave an intimate partner. They want relationships. We always want that which we cannot get. We always want, want most what we are incapable of. We dream and fantasize because we can't face reality. We can't face our own limitations and constraints in reality. So, of course, people with insecure attachment styles, the thing they want most is to have a long-term, committed, loving, embracing, accepting, warm relationship. And that's the only thing they can never get. Richard Grannon once told me that intimacy is kryptonite to many people. And so these relationship misfits, they subvert and they undermine their relationships. They gain fake intimacy and acceptance and fake warmth via sex with strangers. Some, some of them even have sex with groups of strangers just to be accepted, just to feel a warm body next to them just to, to be the center of attention, just for a fleeting moment to experience intimacy. They feel liked, air quotes, they feel loved. They feel that they are in a connection when they are actually, what they're actually doing is casual drunk encounters with anonymous partners in CD settings. So these people, want relationships, crave intimacy, can't get it, so they lie to themselves. They lie to themselves. They team up with strangers for sex and they conflate and confuse sex with intimacy and they conflate and confuse these strangers with intimate partners. Typically they experience dissonance with their choices and they resolve this dissonance by dissociating from the situation simply forgetting about it. They numb their emotions, they abuse substances, and they have reduced effect display. Some people, some of these people who are incapable of intimacy, love, and relationships convert their ego dystony into a narrative ideology of empowerment. I am not in a relationship because that's my choice. I have casual sex because I want it and I get what I want. It empowers me. I'm empowered. It's nonsense, of course. It's self-deception. Very primitive one in that. And it coalesces into a crusty ideology. And this ideology sometimes becomes public in victimhood movements like feminism, late feminism. People who dread intimacy feel a lot more unencumbered with strangers. They feel that an interaction with a stranger is easier, lighter, less threatening, more pleasant, and has an end, has a horizon. Doesn't have to go on forever. There are no demands, no commitments, minimal investment. And so it's all lighthearted fun. 
But that's not what they want. They want intimacy. They want depth. They want prof the profundity of a relationship. They want to be known and seen. And you can't have that in casual sex, or in a one night stand. So what they do, these people, they use fantasy to compensate for the low level of intimacy in these unsatisfactory, exploitative, and often predatory encounters. Many, many people with insecure attachment styles, those who had repeatedly failed in attempted relationships, those who had gone through a dizzying array of pseudo relationships, they give up on the chase. They give up on the chase, they settle into a career centered life of celibacy and self sufficiency. Okay, that's the introduction. Now, today I want to introduce you to a cutting edge model of attachment uh, known as dynamic maturational model of attachment and adaptation. It deals, of course, with relationships and the effect of relationships on human development and human functioning. It starts with relationships between children and parents and goes all the way to relationships between what they call, what the theory calls, reproductive couples. It's an extension of late work by John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth. Bowlby and Ainsworth, especially Ainsworth, Mary and Ainsworth, John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth. Mary Ainsworth, in her late work, had transitioned from emphasis on attachment, safe base, love. She had transitioned from this to emphasis on danger. Mary Ainsworth was the first to introduce the concept of danger, life's many dangers, and how the dangers of life drive, drive adaptation all kinds of adaptations. One of them is attachment. But DMM, the I remind you, the dynamic maturational model of attachment and adaptation. Yes, DMM from now on. DMM was initially uh, put together, coalesced in the work of Patricia McKinsey Crittenden. Crittenden, C-R-I-T-T-E-N-D-E-N. Patricia McKinsey Crittenden. She had many colleagues. She collaborated with many other scholars like Dilala, Angelica Clausen, uh, Andrea Landini, who had written a book much later, Steve Farnfield and Susan Speaker, Speaker and, and uh, many others. So, the, D the DMM's main tenet is that exposure to danger drives neural development and adaptation in order to promote survival and that the greatest dangers are in relationships. And now the problem is that people with insecure attachment styles perceive dangers in relationships even when there are none. They perceive the relationship itself as a danger and the intimacy in the relationship as a catastrophe. So they are threatened not by something that happens in the relationship, not by some developments, not by some events, or not by the choices and decisions of their partners. They are threatened by the very existence, factual existence of the relationship. Being in a relationship in their minds constitute danger. Just to clarify something, DMM does not recognize the distinction between secure and insecure attachment styles it actually dispenses with the whole idea of attachment styles. So I'm, I'm conflating, I'm confusing a bit several attachment theories when I'm talking to you right now, but I'm eclectic. I believe you should take the best from each theory. You don't need to adhere religiously to a single model. So when a person needs protection, when a person needs comfort from danger, they go to someone else. They go to another person. They develop protective relationships so we all develop protective relationships. We perceive dangers in the environment, sometimes in ourselves, but definitely in the environment. We perceive dangers in our relationships. And then we adopt someone else 
as a protective person. Borderlines call it special friend. And so the protective relationship is very crucial because the nature of the relationship generates relation-specific self-protective strategies. In other words, relationships dictate the strategies for self-protection, not the other way. Until recently, until Crittenden's work, we thought that relationships, um, strategies dictate relationships. Crittenden uh, upended this. She suggests that relationships actually dictate which strategies are available to us um, in terms of self-protection. The, DM, the DMM <clears throat> describes protective strategies, aspects of parent-child relationships, romantic relationships, relationships between patients, clients, long-term professionals. I mean, it's, it's very complex and, and very confounded and a, a very fascinating um, uh, fascinating uh, theory and I recommend to I recommend that you have a look a deeper look at it um, in your spare time what I would like to focus on today is a lot more pragmatic a lot more practical how does the DMM translate into day to day into day to day attachment reactions how do we how can we look at everyone around us and classify them in terms of the various strategies of DMM attachment. So to do this, I would like to recap, to recap, perhaps more in layman's terms, I'd like to recap the DMM, the dynamic maturational model of attachment and adaptation, DMM. It emphasizes the, the dynamic interaction of the maturation of the human organism across the lifespan with a context in which maturational possibilities are used and they are used for three goals for, to satisfy to meet three needs requirements and goals so the dynamic the dmm says there is an interaction between people the interaction between organisms this drives neurological development development of the brain and the, and the because the brain is neuroplastic. This development never stops. It's across the lifespan. Now, the context, the relationships, determine the strategies and the pathways of neural uh, development. And there are three goals, three aims. One is to protect the self. The second one, second goal, is to reproduce. And the third goal is to protect one's offspring or progeny so very simple protect yourself so that you can reproduce so that you can protect your children Mat maturation in dmm is neurological mental physical everything it's an integrated theory of attachment and it involves the increase in potential during childhood and adulthood but also the ultimate decrease in old age so it's a lifespan attachment theory and it deals with a multiplicity of contexts people and places that affect development anything from family to school to workplace etc it's, it's a very rich theory the context is not limited to the environment so it's not an environment strictly environmental theory because there are attachment theories that attribute attachment reactions and attachment strategies to environmental cues exclusively, not the DMM. The context in the DMM includes intra, intra, uh, internal challenges, but also interpersonal challenges. In other words, internal processes, but also processes one has with other people in different periods of the lifespan, infancy, preschool, school age, adolescence, adulthood. And the outcome of all these um, complexes, webs, webs of interactions embedded in context and with other people, the outcome of all this is a kind of emerging organization. Now, again, the DMM does not accept the distinction between disorganized attachment and organized attachment, because the DMM says there's no such thing as disorganized attachment. There's no way to survive 
without attachment. And there's no way to come up with an attachment strategy if it's not organized. So the DMM dispenses with the idea of disorganized attachment. But the outcome of the DMM is the organization of mental and behavioral strategies of protection for the self and for one's children, the progeny. And this, these are the patterns, patterns of attachments. Attachment. So the DMM actually, the main hypothesis of the DMM is that maturation creates complexity. Maturation creates novelty. Maturation drives us to develop ever newer, ever more novel and complex mental and behavioral processes. Changes in context provide the occasion and the catalyst for using these processes and giving they give rise to these processes. So there's a need for maturing individuals to attribute meaning. It's an integral part of my work as well. I think there's nothing more important to, to people than meaning. Maturing individuals, according to the DMM, need to imbue complex, ambiguous, incomplete and deceptive information with meaning. So they are busy all the time making sense of what's happening around them and to them and, to, and with other people in ways that promote self-protective behavior. It's an interaction of maturation with experience. The particular organization of self-protective behavior reflects the strategies. And these strategies help the individual to identify, prevent, and protect the self from the dangers of particular contexts and particular relationships. At the same time, there's a, it promotes exploration of other people, of aspects of life, of the environment, and via introspection of oneself. Exposure to danger differs by age, differs by person, family, cultural groups, but ultimately the patterns of attachment will reflect individual developmental theory, history, family organization of self-protective strategies, and cultural experience with persistent local dangers. That's the DMM. And now, the DMM accounts fully for people with insecure attachment styles or people who are incapable of intimacy, love, and functional relationships. We'll come to it in a minute. But to get there, we need to understand that as we grow up, as we move through the lifespan, as we grow older, we keep accumulating layers upon layers of attachment strategies. And all these attachment strategies are simultaneously functional. So it would be wrong to reduce any single individual to a single attachment strategy or a single attachment pattern or a single attachment theory or style because everyone displays very complex, multi-layered archaeological and historical behavior when it comes to relating to other people, to attachment. Of course, in infancy, the repertory is very limited. Now, um, Crittenden adopted Ainsworth ABC classification. Ainsworth came up with three types of attachment strategies or attachment situations um, follow, following the famous stranger experiments or stranger positions. So Ainsworth suggested that there's ABC and only B is confident, secure, safe base attachment. A and C are not. So Crittenden and her collaborators had adopted this ABC, ABC classification and they divided attachment strategies to ABC. So in childhood, we have the first type of attachment strategy we develop is in inhibited, socially facile. So this is called A12 strategy. A12 strategy uses cognitive prediction in the context of very little real threat. It can be described as anticipatory anxiety. Attachment figures 
in this inhibited style. Attachment figures are idealized by overlooking their negative qualities. And this is typically what babies do. They overlook mommy's negative qualities because if mommy is a negative figure, if she is bad, a bad object, it's very threatening. And this is where I part ways with Klein, Melanie Klein. I disagree with her. I think children tend to idealize the mother. Um, I think the splitting, the splitting theory in early object relation schools was totally got it totally wrong. Uh, Crittenden agrees. So in the inhibited attachment style, attachment figures like mummy are idealized by overlooking the negative qualities. The self is put down a bit. So to create a comparative good bed dichotomy, it's a form of dichotomous thinking, splitting. Most most children, most most babies, most infants with with this inhibited attachment style A12, they're predictable and responsible. And they when they become adult, they become predictable and responsible people. They are cool. They're businesslike. Type A strategies all rely on inhibition of feelings. They set danger at a psychological distance from the self. It's like if I don't show you who I am, if I'm inhibited, if I don't lose control, then I can keep the danger at arm's length. And this strategy is first used at infancy, amazingly. Mothers would describe cold babies with kind of um, RAD, or mild RAD, reactive attachment disorder. The second strategy is B12. Again, we are right now in infancy. The first few formative years, let's say zero to four or zero to six. So the second attachment style that emerges in this infancy phase is B12. Remember, these attachment styles start at infancy, but remain for life. Other attachment styles start in adolescence, in puberty, and remain for life. There is an accrual of attachment styles, and we will come, we'll, when we wrap up all this, we will come back to the issue of people who cannot have intimacy and relationships. Why is that? Okay, so B12 is known as the reserved attachment uh, strategy. These individuals are a bit more inhibited with regard to negative effect. Uh, but are inherently balanced and well-functioning. So they are a bit reserved. They will not show you, they will not show anger or visible envy or any negative affectivity, but they're essentially balanced. So B12 is a, is, a, is a constructive, productive, functional uh, attachment strategy. B3, again in infancy, the type B strategy involves a balanced integration of temporal prediction with effect. Let me explain. Type B individuals show all kinds of behaviors, but they are very similar in that they're able to adapt to a wide variety of situations in ways which are self-protective, protective of their children, and that as often as possible cause others no harm. So it's a kind of, the B strategies are strategies that like live and let live. I'll protect myself, I'll protect my children, but I will not do this at your expense. B people, B type people, they communicate directly, negotiate differences, find mutually satisfactory compromises. They distort cognitive and affective information very little, especially not to themselves. They're not self-deceptive. This is relationship material. These are the good ones, the ones that got away. Finally, people with B strategies display a wider range of individual variation than people using other strategies. Because people using other strategies, they go through a process called constriction. They constrain their functioning. They alter their behavior and their strategies and their choices and their decisions in order to employ their attachment strategy. B people, people with B strategies, don't do this. This strategy functions in infancy. 
by adulthood, two sorts of B strategies can be differentiated. Naive bees had simply had the good fortune to grow up in safety and security with good enough parenting. Mature bees have reached neurological maturity, usually by mid, the mid-30s. They've reached neuro neurological maturity. They function in life's major roles as a spouse, as a parent, someone's child. And they carry out an ongoing process of psychological integration across relationships, roles, and contexts. Naive bees tend to be simplistic. Mature bees grapple with life's complexities and nuances. But both of them are very good for relationships. Both of them are very, very healthy attachment strategies. B4-5, that's a reactive strategy. These are individuals who exaggerate negative effect, but only a bit. They're a bit sentimental. Sometimes they're irritated, but inherently they're still balanced. Generally, B strategies a balance. Now we come to dysfunctional strategies. You remember that A and C, A and C are not safe strategies, not functional, not balanced, not secure, insecure. That's Ainsworth contribution. So let's now review the C strategies that emerge in childhood and remain for life. C12, threatening, disarming strategy. It involves relying on one's own feelings to guide behavior. These are the kind of people who say, I trust my intuition, I'm never wrong. So they would rather trust their gut instincts than any rational analysis and any counter countervailing information or data. They have confirmation bias, which is set centered on their own grandiose infallibility. So these people also use somewhat exaggerated and, and they change displayed negative effect. So they're a bit off the charts, they're a bit out there. Uh, and their main aim is to influence other people's behavior. So what they do, they exaggerate their displayed negative effect, or they change it suddenly. Um, that is intermittent reinforcement. Specifically, the strategy of C12 consists of splitting, exaggerating, and alternating the display of mixed negative feelings in order to attract attention and manipulate the feelings and responses of other people. The alternation is between presentation of a strong, angry, invulnerable self who blames others for any problem, alloplastic defenses, and the appearance of a weak, fearful, and vulnerable self who entices others to give succorance and protection. So we have this alternation. C12 is a very normal strategy. It's found in people with low risk for mental health problems and a great zest for life. So while C12 is a manipulative strategy and grounded in some form of grandiosity, it is still highly functional, highly functional for the individual, and to some extent, highly functional for the intimate partners of the individual. So this is the, this is the picture in infancy. One could say that in infancy, the preponderance of dysfunctional attachment strategies is very low because the child cannot afford cannot afford to not get attached a child whose attachment strategy fails is at risk for for her life it's a question of survival you need to attach even if you are c type even if you are a type which are very bad types as we will see later on you still need to attach so there's a lot a lot of constraining of negative affectivity, of changeability, of mood, mood lability. There's a lot of constricting and constraining of mental health effects, Oste theoretically, ostensibly. All these infantile attachment styles can still lead to mature adult functional relationships. But then what happens is most infants 
tend to grow up. And as they grow up, they begin to develop attachment strategies which are really, really problematic for relationships, intimacy, and love. So let's continue. You remember all the previous attachment strategies, the infancy ones? They prevail, they continue into, into preschool. So in the preschool, in the, in the infancy phase, uh, the parents mediate the effect of the context upon the infant, including the risk to the infant. Yes, it's, the infant perceives risk and develops strategies mediated via his parents. He has no direct access to reality or to the environment. But in preschool, the, the child begins to learn self, safe forms of self-reliance for short periods of time. He's beginning to wander off. He's beginning to, in other words, separate and become an individual, individuate. And so all the previous strategies continue well into preschool and well into, well into the grave, I mean, throughout life. But new strategies are added. The first new strategy is A3. Individuals using this strategy known as compulsive caregiving. It's actually a strategy first described by Bowlby in 1973. So individuals using this strategy rely on predictable contingencies, inhibit negative effect, and protect themselves by protecting their attachment figure. In childhood, these people try to cheer up or care for a sad, withdrawn, depressed, unavailable, vulnerable attachment figure. In other words, they parentify themselves. They become parent figures to their own attachment figures. Attachment figures is another name for parents in, in most cases. So these children learn that if they want the attachment figure to stick around, and if they want to the attachment figure to function even minimally, they have to parentify, to parent the attachment figure. So they parentify themselves. And so they try to cheer up the parental figure. They try to care for the parental figure. In adulthood, these people usually find employment where they rescue or care for others. They have very strong savior rescuer uh, complexes. And so they gravitate towards other people who appear weak and needy. And this is also true in intimate relationships. They, they fix people, they're fixers, they're healers. And so they would tend to have this messiah fixer complex when they come across a potential intimate partner. I'm gonna fix her. I'm gonna make her, make her better. I'm gonna heal her with my love. The precursors of A3 and A4 can be seen even in infancy. It's in the strange situation experiment. It's very clear. But the strategy only functions fully in preschool years. And so individuals uh, in, this, in this period uh, begin to show signs of this. Now, A3 is where we first encounter promiscuity, casual sex, avoidance of intimacy. And here is what what the literature says. Individuals with, with A3 and A4 use a compulsively promiscuous strategy. This is from, I'm quoting Crittenden, 1995. They use a compulsively promiscuous strategy to avoid genuine intimacy while maintaining human contact. So in casual sex, when you're promiscuous, you have human contact, you have a warm body, you have the smells and the tastes of a partner, but it's not real intimacy. It's not genuine intimacy. It's fake. It's like junk food. It's fake. It's, it's passing. It's ephemeral. And so these people avoid genuine intimacy, says Crittenden, while maintaining human contact and in some cases satisfying sexual desires. Crittenden says, these people with A3, A4 strategy, show false positive effect, including sexual desire, to little known people, strangers, and they protect themselves from rejection by engaging with many people superficially and not getting deeply involved with anyone. This strategy develops in adolescence when past intimate relationships have been treacherous and strangers 
appear to offer the only hope of closeness and sexual satisfaction. It may be displayed in socially promiscuous manner that does not involve sexuality, or in more serious cases as sexual promiscuity. Crittenden regards sexual promiscuity as ex an extreme sign of attachment dysfunction. And so do I. And I'm not talking about agentic promiscuity, which is basically an empowered choice. I'm talking about compulsive promiscuity that involves sexual self-trashing, masochistic, self-defeating, self-destructive, reckless behaviors. Now, A4, compulsively compliant individuals, were actually first described by Crittenden and Dilala in 1988. They try to prevent danger. They inhibit negative effect and they protect themselves by doing what attachment figures want them to do. They are people pleasers, a codependence. If, if the attachment figure is angry and threatening, the compliance level goes up. The attempts to people please escalate. These A4 characters tend to be excessively vigilant, hypervigilant, quick to anticipate and meet other people's wishes, and generally agitated and anxious. The anxiety, however, is ignored and downplayed by the individual and often is somatized. It appears in bodily symptoms that are brushed aside as being unimportant. These A3 and A4 emerge in preschool and remain for life. And so during preschool period, we have the A3, A4, but we also have the C3 and C4. The C3, 4, aggressive, feigned, helpless. It's a strategy that involves alternating aggression with apparent helplessness to cause other people to comply out of fear of being attacked or to cause people to assist out of fear that one cannot care for oneself. So it's dual messaging. It's like a mixed signal. I'm going to attack you, so you better, you better comply. You better do what I want you to do. You better, you know, cater to my needs. And if not, then I'm going to destroy myself. I'm going to victimize myself because I'm helpless, and and I I can't do otherwise. So you need to help me. You need to help me because I cannot care for myself. So there's an alternation between these two, this aggression and learned or feigned helplessness. Individuals using C3, which is the aggressive variant, this strategy, they emphasize their anger in order to demand caregivers' compliance. And those using the, three, the C4, feigned helplessness, which is a form of aggression, of course. Codependency involves emotional blackmail. It's aggression. So. C4, feigned helplessness. Th these people give signals of incompetence, inadequacy, submission, need, extreme neediness. The angry presentation, C C3, elicits compliance and guilt in other people. Whereas the vulnerable presentation, C4, elicits rescue, saving, fixing, healing. Now, again, you can see all these behaviors in infancy, but the strategy only functions, only bl blossoms, flourishes in preschool years and later. And then, of course, after preschool, what do we have? School, school age. In school age, people establish symmetrical attachments with best friends, for example, while concurrently maintaining affiliative peer relationships. So it's all about peers. The reference group is peers, and peers have a much bigger influence than, for example, parental figures or teachers or even role models or celebrities. During school years, again, we have all the previous attachment strategies. I repeat again, previous attachment strategies developed earlier in life persist and survive into death throughout the lifespan. So in school years, we have everything we had before, but a new strategy emerges and it's known as C56. It's an extreme form of C34. It involves active deception to carry out the revenge or illicit rescue. It's about revenge and rescue. 
Individuals using this strategy substantially distort information, particularly in blaming others for their own predicament and heightening their own negative effect. The outcome is more enduring and less resolvable struggle or conflict. People using C5, which is the punitive strategy, they are called the deceptive, the distant, the self-control. They are much more so than people who use C3. These people appear invulnerable. They dismiss other people's perspectives while forcing other people to attend to them and they mislead other people regarding their own inner feelings of helplessness and desire for comfort. So it's a facade, it's a compensatory thing, and it's very reminiscent, of course, of grandiose narcissism or overt narcissism. Individuals using the C6, which is seductive, this strategy, they give the appearance of needing rescue from dangerous circumstances that are in fact self-induced. C6 individuals, mislead other people regarding how angry they are. And this alternating pattern is often seen in bully victim pairs with gangs and in violent couples, where the hidden half of the pattern is usually forgotten or forgiven until the presentation reverses. And this strategy develops during the school years, but actually it doesn't function fully until adolescence, which is the next stage in the lifespan. In adolescence, we transform best friend attachments into romantic reciprocal attachments with a sexual component. It's here that the failure starts. Here, people who are incapable of love, romantic attachments, intimacy, and relationships, here they trip in adolescence. And so in adolescence, again, we have all the previous attachment strategies, A12, A3, um, a4 and so on and so forth. We have all the all the you know previous strategies, but we have a few new ones. So we have A5. A5 individuals use a compulsively promiscuous strategy. And so um, I mentioned it before, and so A5 blossoms in adolescence. It is where it starts to manifest really powerfully and becomes the dominant attachment strategy for life. People say, well, people can change. It's um, you, you shouldn't inquire too deeply into the past history of your partner. What matters is how your partner is behaving with you now. That's nonsense. The best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. And certain things never change. For example, attachment strategies and attachment styles. So you need to inquire really, really deeply into the background of your partner. Sexual history, relationship history, intimacy skills, relationship outcomes, infidelity if there was any, etc. You need to do all this because it's going to, re it's going to repeat itself. We know, for example, that people who had cheated once are three to five times more likely to cheat again. We even know that people who had been cheated on are far more likely to be cheated on again. It's, it's all pretty predictable. We're pretty predictable people. So this is, um, this is um, the, the, the strategies that are described here are very, very important. They're very important because they give you the tools to classify, sort of, your potential intimate partner and, of course, to classify yourself. And so, if you do that, you're able to predict with a large degree, degree of accuracy what's going to happen. So, A5 individuals are similar to previous attachment style that I had mentioned, and it's a compulsively promiscuous strategy. As I said, it's intended to avoid genuine intimacy and, um, and so on. So, but A6 is a really new layer, a really new strategy which emerges in adolescence. It was first described by Bowlby, who else, in 1980. Individuals who use A6 
It's a compulsively self-reliant strategy. They, these people don't trust other people. They regard other people as unpredictable in their demands. They find themselves inadequate um, in meeting these demands. So they both, they avoid other people and their demands because they think the demands would be capricious and arbitrary. And also they don't believe that they are adequate to answer these demands. People with A6 inhibit negative effect. They protect themselves by relying on no one other than, the, than themselves. They're totally self-sufficient and self-contained. They expect nothing from others. They never ask for help. They reject advice as an intrusion, as an imposition. They, this protects the self from other people, but at the cost of lost help, lost advice, lost comfort, succor, and assistance. It's a big loss. It's, a, it's a not a very not a very wise or clever trade-off, and it's very defensive. Usually the ASIC strategy develops in adolescence, after individuals have discovered that they cannot regulate the behavior of important but dangerous or non-protective givers, caregivers. So these people withdraw from close relationships as soon as they are old enough to care for themselves. There is a social form of strategy in which individuals function adaptively in social and work contexts, but are distant when intimacy is expected in an iso in, in, in isolated form. So some people function perfectly in their careers, in their workplaces, but when intimacy is involved, they, their, their coldness, detachment, avoidance, withdrawal, render it impossible for them to, to connect. There's another form in which individuals, in A A6 individuals, cannot manage any interpersonal relationship and they withdraw as much as possible from other people, totally, to the point of celibacy and schizoid, um, schizoid uh, kind of solitude. And so this emerges in, in adolescence. A6 emerges in adolescence and many of these adolescents are sometimes misdiagnosed as schizotypal or they are the weirdos, the weirdos of the class, and they're mocked, and out, they're, they're outcasts, they're excommunicated, they're ostracized, they are ridiculed, and so on and so forth. And they remain like this for life. And finally, we reach adulthood, most of us. We reach adulthood where we establish symmetrical and reciprocal spousal romantic attachments that foster both partners' development. And there is the nurturance of children in non-reciprocal and non-symmetrical attachment relationships in which the adult is the attachment figure. So we play a dual role. We play a role of an equal with our intimate partner and a role of an attachment figure, which is, again, non-symmetrical with our children, if we have any. All the previous attachment strategies are active very much and in play including many of them who preclude intimacy, love, and relationship, make them impossible. But there are a few additional layers, a few additional strategies that emerge only in adulthood. A7, delusionally idealizing individuals. It's a late addition. Crittenden first described it in 2000. These people have had repeated experience with severe danger that they cannot predict or control. They display brittle, false positive effect and protect themselves by imagining that their powerless or hostile attachment figures will protect them. This is a very desperate strategy of believing falsely in safety when no efforts are likely to reduce the danger. It's a kind of hostage syndrome. Paradoxically, the appearances of, of these people, of A7 people, their appearance is generally pleasing, and there's no hint of the fear and trauma that lie behind the nice exterior until circumstances produce a break in functioning. They suddenly collapse mentally. This pattern only develops in, adult, in adulthood, which says a lot about the kind of adulthood that modern people have. A8, externally assembled self, also described for the first time in, by Crittenden in 2000. So people with A8 attachment strategy do 
is other people require. They are people pleasers. They have few genuine feelings of their own. And they try to protect themselves by absolute reliance on other people, usually professionals who replace their absent or endangering att attachment figures. So Minhausen syndrome and Minhausen by proxy syndrome may be an extension of this. Both A7 and A8 are associated with pervasive and sadistic early abuse and neglect, which finally leads us to psychopathy. Psychopathy emerges in adulthood and it's known as the A plus C plus um, strategy or AC strategies. They combine the sub patterns of both A and C, like it's the best of both worlds. In practice, most of these people um, have distorted patterns. For example, A34 is higher, C34 is higher, you know, this kind of thing. Individuals using these strategies display very sudden shifts in behavior. They're very impulsive, they're very defiant and reckless. In the cases of blended strategies, they show very subtle mixing of distortion and deception. And the extreme form of this is, of course, psychopathy. So, if you have a look, if you review, if you listen back to this recording, you will reach the very sad conclusion that the majority of attachment strategies are focused around fending off danger, protecting oneself, and therefore they are not very conducive to intimacy, love, and relationships. Finally, there's C778, menacing paranoid. It's the most extreme of type C strategies. It involves a willingness to attack anyone, combined with a fear of everyone. Type C strategies all involve distrust of consequences and an excessive reliance on one's own gut feelings. At the extreme, this pattern becomes delusional, with delusions of infinite revenge over ubiquitous enemies, the menacing strategy, C7. On the reverse side, there's paranoia regarding the, these enemies, C8, and these two strategies do not become organized before early adulthood. Reviewing these attachment strategies tells us that when we attempt true intimacy, true love, and abiding functional relationships, we have to overcome many, many layers of disturbed, disturbed attachment, stra attachment strategies. Attachment strategies that lead to fear, danger, avoidance, withdrawal, negative affectivity, or self-denial and self-deception. It is not Therefore, surprising that so many of us fail in our quest to find warmth, acceptance, and a friend, a friend for life, and even the most basic and primitive of all needs and desires, sex. This lesson is titled, So, Can You Change Your Attachment Style? And here is the lecture. The answer is no. Thank you very much for listening and see you in my next video. Just yanking your chain, just pulling your leg. <laughs> cool it. Did you ever hear of a lecture of mine which is less than seven hours? I compete very closely with Fidel Castro, the late Fidel Castro. Okay, Shoshanim, today we are going to discuss the stability of attachment styles. When you finally develop and adopt an attachment style, which is usually right around the end of childhood, the beginning of adolescence, is this att attachment style for life? Is it going to be with you for the entire lifespan? Is there nothing you can do about it? In one word, Yes, there's nothing you can do about it. Attachment style, also known as attachment orientation in some other models of attachment and adaptation, like the DMM, attachment style and attachment orientation are for life. They are immutable. We call it stability. They're stable. But there's a lot you can do about it. You can, for example, 
neutralize your attachment style. If you find your attachment style unacceptable, dysfunctional, if it damages your relationships, if it harms you personally, if you're uncomfortable with it, if you're egodystonic, you can absolutely neutralize your attachment style. You can modify your attachment behaviors. You can become self-aware and then prevent or negate um, a misconduct emanating from your attachment style. So there's a lot you can do. You can even modify your internal relationship model, which is a part of your internal working model. Now we're going to discuss all these issues today and we're going to do a literature rev review, a very extensive literature review. But in a nutshell, while you cannot change, I repeat, you cannot change your attachment style or attachment orienta orientation, you can change many components in your attachment style and the behaviors attendant upon your attachment style. So hope is not lost. On the very contrary, people overcome insecure attachment and they succeed to function well within long-term committed relationships, even though underlying all this is an attachment style which is self-defeating, self-destructive and other destructive. Attachment style which pushes people away. Attachment style which is essentially founded on, on a dread of intimacy. Never mind how bad your attachment style is. And for example, avoidant dismissive is a seriously dysfunctional attachment style. Never mind. You can always overcome it by being self-aware, modifying your behavior, modify your internal working model and working together with therapists and with your partners. Okay, let's get to, let's get to business. And let's start by saying that 70% of people can't change anything about their attachment style. And that's a sad statistic. But the flip side of it is that 30% of people, up to 46%, depending on the study, but usually 30% of people can and do change substantial components and ingredients, ingredients of their attachment style and orientation to the point that effectively they are transforming their attachment or the way they attach to other people. They are transforming their bonding. Attachment behaviors and internal relationship models do change in 30% of people. An internal relationship model is an interaction model between, um, between a child and his caregivers. When the child has experiences with the care caregivers, usually parental figures and more specifically the mother, he internalizes these interactions and he creates a narrative that incorporates them and makes sense of these, um, of these exchanges. And this is known as the model. The internal relationship model becomes a part of the self. The internal relationship model is a subspecies, an example of an internal working model, and we will discuss internal working model at the end of this interminable uh, lecture. The relationship between a person's inner parent and inner child is supposed to be harmonious. They're supposed to love each other. And so the more you had been loved and the better you had been treated, the more your model, internal working model, internal relationship model approximates functionality the better this model is for you and with you. But if the relationship between your inner parent and inner child is pathological in some way, if you have had what Andre Green called the, a dead mother, an absent, selfish, depressed, parentifying mother, then you would have a lot of rage and a lot of hatred bottled up inside you. And then the more you are loved, the more this rage and hatred are going to manifest. You had learned as a child to associate love with pain and hurt. And so anyone who tries to love you is a persecutory object, object, a potential enemy. All important external relationships are extensions and projections of internal relationship models. 
The more important the external relationship, the more intimate it is, the more powerful the inner relationship model is projected and activated. And so, the more you are terrified of intimacy and, and love, the, the more hateful, resentful and aggressive you are when someone tries to love you and when you become intimate. We're going to discuss all this when we talk about the internal working model. The internal working model of attachment is a mental representation formed through the child's early experiences with the primary caregiver. And this mental representation influences how the child interacts and builds relationships with other people as the child grows up. We call this process object relations. It also explains the differences in human behaviors among people, but we'll not go into it. Now, what can you do about your attachment style or attachment orientation? This is something you had received as a legacy uh, in childhood, and then you're stuck with it for life. Yes, you can't control your attachment style and you can't change it. Never mind what, <laughs> what people say. But what you can do, you can definitely modify your behaviors. You can become self-aware. You're an adult now. So you can, you can realize that your behaviors are counterproductive, destructive, self-defeating and other defeating, hurtful and push people away. So you can modify these behaviors to counter the effects of the attachment style, to neutralize the attachment style. Also, you can modulate the intensity of your attachment orientation or attachment style. You can tell yourself, literally tell yourself, I'm being, I'm being avoidant now. I'm being dismissive. I'm being paranoid. And I'm going to control this. I'm going to take hold of myself. I'm going to regain control. I'm going to become self-aware and I'm going to tamp down these bad behaviors, behaviors that they make me and people around me sad and mad and sometimes bad. So I'm going to, I'm going to change the way I interact with people. Deep inside, for example, I'm uncomfortable with intimacy because I have an avoidant um, attachment style. So intimacy frightens me. Intimacy terrifies me deep inside. But I'm going to, but I'm going to force myself to be intimate with someone I trust. And I'm not going to undermine the intimacy. And I'm not going to do crazy things like cheating or stealing or lying so that I, I maintain the intimacy. I'm going to go through with it. I'm going to be brave. I'm going to be a big boy or a big girl. And so the intensity, the intensity can be modulated. And it's very important because once the intensity is, is brought down, the attachment style becomes a lot more secure, even if internally it's exactly the opposite. The changes in intensity, in behaviors, and in the internal working models are brought on and mediated via qualitative relationships or the quality of relationships. If a relationship is, if you have, if you have a series of good relationships, healthy, loving, caring relationships with empathic people, you will likely take more risks in future relationships. So ipso facto, by definition, you will have become more secure. Even if your internal style is immutable, the same outwardly, behaviorally, you'll become more secure. But if you're exposed to abuse, to bullying, to intermittent reinforcement, if you were, if you, if you had a succession of partners who broke your heart and dismissed you and humiliated you and rejected you, then of course, um, you may develop avoidance, even if your attachment style is basically secure. In other words, you can be, you can be conditioned to some extent, um, and your behavior can be modified. So quality of relationships. Then there's an issue of trauma. If you experience trauma, it tends to change the way your attachment style is expressed. Now that's a very important distinction. Attachment styles can be expressed in myriad ways. <laughs> and so you could have the same attachment style from cradle to grave, and yet behave very differently in different periods of your life because you're expressing the attachment style, the underlying attachment style very differently. So trauma changes the expression of attachment style. 
therapy, a good therapist. If it's a psychodynamic therapist, using trans transference and countertransference. If it's a CBT therapist, using, you know, um, reframing and other CBT techniques, but a good therapist, a therapist who provides you with a holding environment, a containing environment, a therapist who provides you with, in essence, unconditional acceptance in a way. Such a therapist can induce massive changes in you. He can be a proxy for or a surrogate for an intimate relationship, kind of a bridge. So therapy is very crucial. If you have person a personality disorder, that's a very bad prognosticator. It means that your attachment style is extremely likely to be deficient, dysfunctional and insecure. Narc narcissists, for example, people with narcissistic personality disorder, people with borderline personality disorder, let alone psychopaths, they all have severe attachment dysfunctions because they are incapable of perceiving other people as separate entities with their own needs and wishes and preferences and priorities. So they are unable to relate to other people as external objects. The psychopath treats other people as instruments. The borderline treats other people as external regulators of her ego functions, the boundary, ego boundary functions. The narcissist treats other people as sources of narcissistic supply. This is not, this is a bad ground. <laughs> this is not the right ground for, for uh, attachment. This is wrong soil. No attachment is going to grow there. So personality disorders. And finally, life crisis. Life crisis can induce an apparent change in personality orientation, which is actually a change in behavior, not in orientation. We're going to delve in the second half of the lecture, we're going to delve into the issue of internal relationship models, internal working models, and how they can be modified. But I promised you a literature review, a boring literature review, and I'm a man of my word. Plus, it's a pleasure to torture you. We start um, with an, a very recent article, um, Chopic, Edelstein and Grimm, 2019. The article is titled Longitudinal Changes in Attachment Orientation Over a 59-Year Period. It was published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, Volume 116, of course. And I'm going to read to you the abstract. Research on individual differences in attachment and their links to emotion, cognition and behavior in close relationships has proliferated over the last few decades. However, the majority of this research has focused on children and young adults. Little is known about mean level changes in attachment orientation beyond early life, in part due to a dearth of longitudinal data on attachment across the lifespan. We found, say the authors, we found that attachment anxiety declined on average with age, particularly during middle age and older adulthood. So they're talking about intensity. Yes, intensity declines with age, which is, by the way, very true for a variety of other traits, personality traits, and a variety of other mental health disorders. Psychopathy ameliorates with age. Anxiety ameliorates with age. Um, narcissism changes with age. Borderline personality disorder disappears with age. Age has something to do with all this. And attachment style or attachment orientation is an extensive trait. In other words, it's a trait that is ubiquitous in all areas of life and colors the entire personality. So naturally, it should undergo some kind of change with age. They continue, the authors continue, attachment avoidance decreased in a linear fashion across the lifespan. Being in a relationship predicted lower levels of anxiety and avoidance across adulthood. Men were higher in attachment avoidance at each point in the lifespan. You don't say. <laughs> okay, now back in time, 25 years. We go to an article titled Attachment Styles and Close Relationships, a four-year prospective study. It was authored by Lee Kirkpatrick 
and Cindy Hazen. It was first published in June 1994 in the, personal in the journal Personal Relationships, the journal of the International Association for Relationship Research. Again, I'm going to quote from each article. I'm going to pick up segments from each article and I'm going to read them aloud to you, mainly because I'm lazy. Okay, here's what this article says. A longitudinal study of 177 adults examined the stability of adult attachment styles and of romantic relationships over a four-year period. Findings included the following. A. Attachment styles were highly stable over time. I told you so. B. Attachment style was a significant predictor of relationship status. C. This effect was mediated by concurrent attachment style. D. In other words, attachment style modif modulation or modification. D. Secure respondents were less likely than insecure respondents to report one or more breakups during the four-year interval, but E. Paradoxically, ambivalent respondents were just as likely as secure respondents to be in a relationship with the same partner they had identified four years earlier. And F. Attachment stability was moderated to some extent by the experience of breakup or initiation of a new relationship during the interim. Respondents' ability to recall their previous attachment style was also examined. And so what this, um, at the time, groundbreaking article discovered was that attachment style is stable across a lifespan, but can be modulated, can be extensively modulated, actually, by having a relationship. As simple as that. Now we go forward to 2011, to a very important article, seminal article. It was published in the Australian, believe it or not, Journal of Educational and Developmental Psychology. There is such a thing, volume 11. It's a new, a new academic journal, but of high standard. So the, the article is titled, Attachment Across the Lifespan, Factors that Contribute to Stability and Change. It was authored by Megan, Megan McConnell, McConnell of McGill University in Canada and Ellen Moss of the Université de, de Québec in Montreal. So again, I'm going to quote from the article, but this time I'm going to quote extensively because it's, in my view, the best review of attachment literature extant to this very day. So here's what the authors say. A number of studies have examined continuity of attachment from infancy to adolescence and adulthood in both low and high risk samples. I'm referring you here to Hamilton 2000, Waters, Merrick, Trebou, uh, Crowell and Albersheim 2000, Lewis, Firing and Rosenthal 2000, Weinfeld, Sruf and Egerland 2000. 2000 was a vintage year for attachment studies. So, continuity from infancy to adolescence to adulthood was studied, you know, was in investigated in all these studies. Results from these studies, say the authors, have indicated that factors such as divorce, single parenthood, life-threatening illnesses within the family, parental drug abuse, death of a family member, and other negative life events were all indicative of change to attachment insecurity. As I said before, life crises have an effect, modulating effect on the intensity uh, of the uh, underlying attachment style. In addition to the longitudinal studies, continue the authors, in addition to these studies, looking at attachment stability, the research on this topic has expanded over the last two decades, as investigators have examined continuity and discontinuity across particular developmental periods, such as infancy. And here I refer you to Baikaim, Sutton, Fox and Marvin, 2000, Egerland and Farber, 1984, Vondra, Homer, Ding and Shaw, 1999. Uh, continuity of attachment style had been studied even in early childhood. I refer you to Moss, Sear, Brouault, Tarabulski and Dubois Comtois, 2005, and to the NICHD stu study in 2001. Many studies dealt with continuity of attachment style in middle childhood and adolescence. Ellen 
Mekele Haini, Copper Mink, and Jody, 2004. Amaniti, Van Isedorn, <laughs> Speranza and Tambelli in 2000, etc., etc. And finally, there were even studies which went into adulthood and investigated whether attachment styles are stable in adulthood. And so I refer you to Crowell, Trebou and Waters, 2002, Scharf, Bartholomew, 1994, Jean, Labois, V, Vief, 2004. Okay, so this is a literature review. You see that there are dozens of studies which had dealt with the issue of stability of attachment style across the lifespan. And the authors, the authors of the article that was published in the Australian journal say, these studies have also identified variables such as stressful life events, family risk and depression as predictive of change from security to insecurity or disorganization. And they refer to studies by Ellen McElhaney and Cooper Mink and Jody, 2004, which I mentioned before, by Chaim, uh, Sutton Fox and Marvin study, 2000, Moss, Sear, Bureau, Tarabulski, Dubois, Comtois, 2005, the, the studies that I mentioned. Okay, where are we going with all this? What are the authors trying to say? First, they qualify. They say there have been fewer findings regarding the factors that contribute to stable security or change from insecurity to security. Of the studies that have succeeded in discovering results related to the trajectory towards security, variables such as relationship satisfaction, greater emotional openness, and fewer negative life events have been found to be related to change towards attachment security. And they refer to studies by Eagleland and Faber, 1984, and Vondra et Elias, um, 1999. Currently, say the author, there's a paucity of literature integrating all the findings on attachment stability. There are no reviews that have examined the literature on attachment stability across a lifespan. The conclusion of the article is this. In summary, this review documents the variables that influence stability and change in attachment across the developmental periods of infancy, preschool, adolescence and adulthood, and between infancy and adolescence and adulthood. This paper provides a unique contribution to the literature on attachment stability by identifying the specific developmental factors that influence continuity and discontinuity across the lifespan. Additionally, variables that are influential in predicting stable security and change to security were examined. In infancy, variables such as maternal depression, antisocial behavior, maternal employment, child rearing methods, etc seem to have more of an influence in predicting stability and change in attachment across infancy, since they directly impact caregiving behavior. And since the attachment relationship is in the process of formation during infancy, variables that directly alter caregiving behavior have a significant impact on the attachment relationship. Additionally, say the authors, external factors such as negative life events and factors that operate within the marital relationship such as relationship satisfaction, also influence stability and change in attachment style during this developmental period. Therefore, factors that influence maternal behavior directly, as well as factors that stem from the environment and within the family, the all important predictors of stability and change during infancy. During early childhood, maternal factors appear to play less of a role in predicting stability and change in attachment. While there are still associations between some caregiving behaviors, such as maternal sensitivity and change in attachment classification, factors such as negative life events, marital satisfaction, and more than 10 hours a week in childcare are just as influential in predicting stability and change in attachment during this period of early childhood. This makes sense given that developmentally the preschool child is more capable of interacting with their environment and less restricted to proximity seeking behavior. Across the period of adolescence, factors related to identity and communication in family interactions, as well as depression, play a role in predicting stability and change during adolescence. There are important issues that adolescents often struggle with 
And it seems appropriate that they would be influential in affecting the course of the parent-child relationship during this period. Negative life events were also shown to predict stability and change during this time of adolescence, indicating that external factors continue to operate in ways that alter or stabilize the parent-child relationship. In adulthood, variables such as coping, well-being, and environmental stress all influence stability and change in attachment relationships with parents or partners during this period. It seems that factors which are more prevalent for adults, such as coping and well-being, have a greater impact on attachment relationships with either a parent or a partner. These variables, along with those which are external, such as environmental stress, work together to either sustain or modify attachment relationships. In regard to stability from infancy to adolescence to adulthood, negative life events stand out as the strongest predictor in influencing change to insecurity in attachment relationships over time. Events such as the loss of a parent or family member, parental divorce, living in poverty, parental hospitalization, or abuse all significantly alter caregiving behavior and dynamics within the family. Those factors that maintain stability or predict change to security in attachment relationships over time are less clear. What is clear, however, is that experiencing a negative life event has a dramatic effect on the quality of the parent-child relationship, and this will likely set the stage for other maladaptive outcomes for the child later in life. I've read, I've read the whole very long article, I think it was about 30-something pages, and what the authors are actually saying is that sometimes after adverse, adverse childhood experiences, ACE, and negative life events or life crises, sometimes people develop insecurity or increased insecurity, but we don't know whether people transition from insecurity to security, and if so, what causes it? It's as simple as that. So it's easy to become less secure. We have no proper documentation of cases where people became more secure. And even in transition from secure to insecure, this is usually in the margins and usually temporary. And so it's, it looks much more like a modification of behaviors, intensity, and the internal working model than anything fundamental because people afterwards default to the original attachment style. So yes, attachment styles can be suspended, can be, old, can be modified to some extent, they can be played with, they can be neutralized, but there is no proof at this stage in any study that attachment styles, one attachment style disappears and another one appears and there's god awful confusion between attachment styles, behavior, uh, attachment behaviors, and internal relationship models. Let's go to another article, 1997. Why does attachment style change? J. Davila, D. Burge, and C. Heyman. It was published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, October uh, 1997. Again, I'm going to read to you the abstract. Adult attachment research has proceeded on the assumption that attachment style is relatively stable and affects future functioning. However, researchers have become interested in attachment instability. Mind you, not change. <laughs> instability. I repeat, however, researchers have become interested in attachment instability and predictors of attachment style change. In this article, two concept conceptualizations of attachment style change were examined. Attachment style change is a reaction to current circumstances, and attachment style change is an individual difference in susceptibility to change that is associated with stable vulnerability factors. A total of 155 women were assessed after high school graduation in six months and two years later. Results primarily supported the conceptualization of attachment style change 
as individual, as an individual difference. Specifically, some women may be prone to attachment fluctuations, not changing, fluctuations because of adverse earlier experiences. As I said, bad, bad relationships, abuse, trauma. And women who show attachment fluctuations, say the authors, are similar to women with stably insecure attachments. In other words, some women who are vulnerable, susceptible, who had gone through bad life experiences, these women show fluctuations in their attachment style, but these fluctuations are indistinguishable from a stable, insecure attachment. Okay, we proceed. From the journal Personality and Social Psychology Review, a 2017 article, Revising Working Models Across Time, Relationship Situations That Enhance Attachment Security. The authors are Ariaga, Kumashiro, Simpson, and others. It was published in June 2017. Now, this is a very interesting article because it is among the first to link attachment fluctuations or attachment instability with internal, internal working models. The authors propose the attachment, I, I'm reading the abstract to you. The authors propose, we propose, the authors propose the attachment security enhancement model, ASEM, attachment security enhancement model, to suggest how romantic relationships can promote chronic attachment security. One part of the ASEM examines partner responses that protect relationships from the erosive effects of immediate insecurity. But such responses may not necessarily address underlying insecurities in a person's mental models. This is a very important distinction. What the authors are saying is, if you have a good partner, a loving, caring, empathic partner, supportive partner, your, the expression of your insecure attachment style can be mitigated and ameliorated. Outwardly, you will appear to be more secure, but it has nothing to do, it does not, I, I repeat, it does not necessarily address underlying insecurities in the person's mental models. So the insecurity is still there, the attachment style is stable, the working model is unchanged, but you trust your partner, your partner loves you, cares for you, and you let go. You, and by letting go, you appear to be more secure. But it's not real security because it's actually relegating several ego boundary functions to the partner. This is what many borderlines do. This kind of, this kind of situation, in this kind of situation, it's like the person with the insecure attachment style says, okay, I'm going to let you secure my attachment style. You will be my attachment style. He's telling the intimate partner, I trust you, I believe in you, I know you love me. So I'm going to let you dictate how I am to behave in this attachment relationship. So intimate partner kind of regulates the fluctuations of the insecure attachment style. I continue with the, with the article. The authors say, therefore, a second part of the ASEM, and to remind you, ASEM is Attachment Security Enhancement Model. So a second part of the ASEM examines relationship situations that foster more secure mental models. Both parts may work in tandem. We posit that attachment anxiety should decline most in situations that foster greater personal confidence and more secure mental models of the self. In contrast, attachment avoidance should decline most in situations that involve positive dependence and foster more secure models of close others, which is a fancy way of saying what I just said. The ASCM integrates research and theory, suggests novel directions, etc., etc. That's the propaganda bit. Let's go really back to the founding fathers of the whole thing, Bowelby, Bartholomew, Horowitz, and others. 
I'm going to read to you the abstract of a very, very ancient article, 1991, Bartholomew and Horowitz, Attachment Styles Among Young Adults, a test of four category model, Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, volume 61. Here's the abstract. A new four group model of attachment styles in adulthood is proposed. Four prototypic attachment patterns are defined using combinations of a person's self-image, positive or negative, and image of others, positive or negative. In study one, an interview was developed to yield continuous and categorical ratings of the four attachment styles. Intercorrelations of the attachment ratings were consistent with the proposed model. Attachment ratings were validated by the self-report measures of self-concept and interpersonal function. Each style was associated with a distinct profile of interpersonal problems, according to both self and friend reports. In study two, attachment styles within the family of origin and with peers were assessed independently. The results of study one were replicated. The proposed model was shown to be applicable to repre representations of family relations. Attachment styles with peers were correlated with family attachment ratings, so they're stable across environments. When you see someone who used to be needy and clinging and became avoidant, someone who used to be anxious, preoccupied and avoidant or dismissive, and became secure. Someone who used to be secure and is suddenly insecure. When you see these things, you say, wow, attachment styles are fluid. They're in flux. They change. But that's not true. We know it's not true because people default after some time to the original attachment style. So what, what does change? Because clearly there's a change. Any therapist will tell you. So what does change? Well, first and foremost, self-awareness. Self-awareness creates a feedback loop that modifies attitude to, a, to a attachment. In attachment, we have three elements, attitude, desire, and behavior. And self-awareness modifies attitude and to some extent desire. And this of course leads to behavior modification. And the more you behave, the more feedback you get. And the, the more positive the feedback, the more self-efficacious you feel. So this gives you an incentive, incentivizes you to behave in certain ways. We call this positive reinforcement. And so this is one, one trajectory, one way that visible attachment changes. The other way is by changing the way you see the world. The way you see the world, the way you see yourself, and the way you see yourself in the world, interacting with other people. And this is known as the internal working model, IWM, internal working model. Like many other things, it was invented by John Bowlby, a brilliant psychiatrist. He came up with the theory of attachment, later modified by Mary Ainsworth and others. I recommend to you to watch my videos on attachment, including the latest one about DMM. But John Bowlby's theory of attachment asserted that infants are born programmed to seek connection and proximity to caretakers because they need to survive. They need to create an attachment bond because otherwise they die. They need food, they need shelter, they need to motivate their mothers and fathers to take care of them. Smiling, crying, these are all signals, bonding signals, attachment signals. Over time, children learn to internalize the, the whole process of attachment. And they use these base relationships with primary objects, primary caregivers. They use these base relationships and they, they form a kind of narrative or script or prototype. And this becomes the template upon which they construct all future intimate relationships. Honestly, all future relationships, not only intimate. And this prototype, the prototypical relationship, it's a kind of an, it's archetype, it's a set of archetypes, and it's called the internal working model. It's very symbolic, it's highly symbolic. It consists of how the child interprets and responds to the caregiver's behaviors. 
the child forms an expectation and then he uses the expectation to plan and to decide on acting and then he acts and then he gets feedback and the feedback modulates and modifies his behavior and it's kind of a, of a loop and so internal working models are very very significant very important in 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 developmental psychology in, in child's development because they're kind of in inner navigation system inner guidance system all future behavior is literally dictated by the internal working model. If you have a view of the world that is hostile and dangerous, it's one thing. And if you have a view of the world that most people are good, that's, you'll have a different life. Internal working models influence emotions, behaviors, cognitions, interactions with others, expectations about relationship, you name it. These are models of the whole world. It's a model of the world. It's a theory of the world. Like we have a theory of mind. Theory of mind is we're trying to decipher what makes people tick, what people are thinking. So theory of the world is the internal working model. These models operate outside of conscious awareness. That's, that's why they're so powerful. They unconsciously direct the attention and the behaviors in relationships. Internal working models are dynamic. Don't misunderstand me. They're not set in stone. They are dynamic. They can change in, in under certain conditions. They tend to remain stable over time, but as opposed to attachment style, they are amenable to change. And very, very often they do change, of course, with experience, with information. With, so they change. And they are so powerful that they change, they affect behavior. And then you say, oh, you see, the attachment style changed. No, the behavior changed within attachment relationships. They're the behaviors within attached relationships had to change because the, in, the model has been modified and is now dictating different expectations and different behaviors. So the quality of the parent-child in early life has huge effect on future relationships. Bowlby says that babies start to form internal working models in early childhood around the age of three. In early infancy, these models are available only for the recognition of the attachment figures and short-term anticipation, of course. They're very kind of animalistic or binary things. But then the child evolves. There's memory, memory creates identity, all kinds of cognitions are linked together, and then they're linked, they're connected to emotions and feelings. And, and so the model becomes much more complex and more enriched. And they become, the model, these models become general mental representations of other people and of yourself, of oneself. You suddenly have a model of yourself and you have a model of other people. And it's the same model. And then you have, you, you put the two parts together and suddenly there's an inter interaction, like sparks in a plug, you know. Suddenly there's an interaction, like two magnets, if you wish, attracting each other. The two parts of a model are indistinguishable. If you modify one part, for example, how you see other people, you modify the other part, how you see yourself, and vice versa. That's why personal experience constantly uh, alters, changes the internal working model and experiences you've had with other people more, more so. In adulthood, this representation, this internal working model, affects everything in your life, your thoughts, your feelings, behavior, human relationships, but especially love relationships, which tend to replicate the first love you ever had, love of mommy. An internal working model of the self arises exactly because you are interacting with other people. It's relational. That's why the very concept of individual, the concept of individual, the concept of personality are highly suspect because the model, the internal model that represents you, the internal model that is you, is totally dependent on the interactions with others, starting with very intimate and close others, like mommy and daddy. A child derives beliefs about how acceptable the self is through the gaze of the primary caregiver. He, is, he judges himself by how responsive they are to him. A child whose caregiver responds reliably, predictably, lovingly, 
embracingly, empathically, this kind of child develops a, a representation of the self as lovable, acceptable, worthwhile. He has what you can call a positive self-image. They see, these children see mother and father and whatever attachment figure there is, they see them as a secure base, a safe base that they can turn to whenever in trouble, whenever in doubt. They, they re these attachment figures represent safety. But imagine that you grow up with an inconsistent or unresponsive attachment figure. And then you develop a view of yourself as unacceptable, unworthy, unlovable. So you have a negative self-image and low self-esteem. And the lack of attachment security means that you don't believe that your caretaker is accessible for safety and comfort. So you have to either refer to yourself, which creates narcissism, or excessively rely on others, which creates all the varieties of codependency. Researchers have identified four attachment styles in adults, according to different combinations of these inner working models of self and others. This secure attachment, a securely attached person possesses a positive sense of worthiness and the expectation that other people are generally accepting and responsive. There's a preoccupied attachment, that kind of person has a sense of unworthiness, but a positive evaluation of others. The person strives to be accepted and valued by other people. Then there is the fearful avoidant attachment. It's a person who has a sense of unworthiness and expectation to be rejected uh, by others who are untrustworthy. And this kind of person protects himself from anticipated rejection and abandonment by avoiding close involvement with others. And yet they have a strong dependency on others to maintain a positive self-image. So they approach avoid all the time, hot and cold. It's very typical of borderline personality disorder. And finally, there's the dismissive avoidant attachment. And that's an individual who, who has a sense of love worthiness. He thinks he's worthy of love, thinks he's lovable, but he has a negative disposition towards other people. And so he protects himself against disappointment. He says, I'm worthy of love, but I'm not going to get it. So he doesn't want to be disappointed. And what he does, he avoids close relationships. He maintains a sense of independence and invulnerability. I'm self-sufficient. I don't need you. Go away. These people are detached or dismissing of attachment and, and, and intimacy. And in many ways, they dread intimacy because it results in hurt and rejection. Attachment styles are not only stable across a lifespan. They are a little like communicable diseases. They can be intergenerationally transmitted. So if a parent has a working model pattern, if a parent has an attachment style, especially if it's an insecure attachment style, he, the parent tends to pass it on to his, off, his or her offspring. There have been studies that show, that show that children have a history of secure attachment at one year old, and they have more adaptive interactions subsequently, not only with parents, but also with peers and with teachers. These children behave in predictable ways, including with their own children when they become parents. So they tend to pass it on. And similarly, maltreated, abused children, they form insecure attachment and they tend to become abusive parents. And they create insecure attachment in their own kids. There are many, many studies that show this. And this maltreated, maltreated, maltreating, hurt people hurt, yeah? maltreated, maltreating cycle. It's very striking because you see how the internal working model is formed in early attachment relationships and then carried forward and reenacted in subsequent relationships. It's what Freud called a repetition compulsion. So attachment styles are actually stable across generations. That's how stable they are. However, we are not automatons. We are not robots. We can become self-aware. We can work on our behaviors. We can modify, modify the way we see ourselves and others. A good therapist will help you with this. A good friend will help you with this. And a good partner is better than both. So, work on yourself. Try to be less scared of the world and less terrified of yourself. Try to be more vulnerable, more open to to the inevitable hurt of loss, as it is loss that is the engine of personal growth, 
in personal development. Hello, Shvanpanim, Shovavim. This is your favorite professor of psychology, minus the hair. Yes, I have sifted through all your complaints, observations, and goodwill suggestions as to what to do. But I'm afraid this is a hairy situation, and here, suit as I am, the only solution. Is to wait. Time heals everything. And my hair has a strange propensity to grow with time. So there's still hope for you, if not for me. Today we are going to discuss the God Almighty confusion between intimacy, emotions, sex, and attachment. You see, when we were teaching our young to decouple sex from emotions, to engage in emotionless, meaningless sex, to think of sex as the antithesis, the opposite of intimacy. When we did this, we did them a disservice. This created an enormous confusion in the minds of the young, as well as in the minds of the old, in the minds of laymen, as well as in the mind of scholars, minds of scholars, as to what exactly is the linkage between intimacy, emotions? What's the connection between sex and intimacy? And how does attachment, and especially attachment styles, how do they fit into this convoluted picture? My name is Sam Vaknin, and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. I'm a professor of psychology and your guide into the darkest corners and recesses of the netherworld of the human mind. Stay with me on this tour. So let's start with intimacy. There is no situation more intimate than psychotherapy. In psychotherapy, you encounter a relative stranger and you tell him everything about yourself. You tell him your deepest secrets. You share with him your sexual peccadillos and um, foibles. You seek his advice as to how to conduct your life. There is no equivalent level of intimacy with your spouse or even with your best friends. Your therapist is by far the most intimate person in your life. Similarly, how many times have you gone to a bar or to a party and you poured your heart out, you confided, in a total stranger, exactly because he is a stranger and you're never, never going to see him again. So it seems that intimacy is not necessarily connected to emotions, as we were taught to believe early on. 
And so intimacy is a state of affairs. It is not a state of mind. Intimacy has nothing to do with emotions. Of course, intimacy can be accompanied by emotions. It can be coupled with emotions. But there is intimacy without emotions, emotionless intimacy. Someone suggested to call it cold intimacy. And there are emotions which do not lead to intimacy. For example, negative emotions. But even positive emotions, such as love, don't necessarily lead to intimacy. They could lead to hurt and pain. So the connection between intimacy and emotions is spurious. It's wrong. It's not true. People, for example, can have sex with total strangers without any emotions, except maybe some mild affection and a modicum of trust. But trust is not an emotion. And there is a big debate whether affection is an emotion or a state of mind or a state of affairs. So, but you can have sex with, with a stranger without any emotions whatsoever. Sometimes you don't even know the name of the stranger. People have sex with strangers and sex is the ultimate in intimacy. There is nothing absolutely more intimate than sex. You let someone into your body if you're a woman and you enter someone else's body if you're a man. Is there any deeper, more profound form of intimacy? If there is, I'm not aware of it. And yet, and yet, sex often comes unaccompanied by emotions, unaccompanied by intimacy, not linked to anything except the physical release and the act itself. Intimacy means doing things together, sleeping together, talking, eating. There could be a, a huge intimacy in a lunch or a dinner, making love. All these are forms of intimacy and they all involve actions, sharing in action, doing something together. But none of these situations necessarily implies, imply or demand the presence of an emotion or an effect. They do not require any affective or emotional correlate. There is intimacy in prison where people are crowded together. There is intimacy, there is intimacy with a prostitute. There is intimacy in a hospital between a patient and her doctor. And as I mentioned, there is intimacy in psychotherapy. All these are intimate but emotionless states. Intimacy in a clinical sense is a state of affairs involving proximity, physical proximity, vulnerability, a display of vulnerability, not being afraid to show vulnerability, in other words, trust, and joint activities, life. So these are the three components of intimacy, proximity, vulnerability, joint activity. Do you hear the word emotions? Do you find the word emotions in this list? You don't, and for good reasons. They are not necessary. They are not strong emotions attached with intimacy necessarily. They can be, but it's not a precondition. And so this is the first confusion. Um, I must say that the young, people under age 25 or even 35, are the most confused about these issues because they have been taught by us, by my generation, by the baby boomers. They have been taught that sex, intimacy, attachment, emotions, these are totally disparate categories and that they should try to detach one from the other. They should engage in sex without emotions. They should have emotions without sex. They should have intimacy without both. And they should um, attach to people without demanding sex or emotions or intimacy. And this is mayhem. This is total chaos. While intimacy does not require emotions, emotions, positive emotions, such as love, do require intimacy. So it's unidirectional. Emotions should lead to intimacy. Intimacy is not necessarily attached to emotions, nor does it often lead to.
to emotions. Same situation, same confusion exists with attachment. People confuse mate selection with attachment style. But these are two separate things. For relationships to work, the attachment styles of both members of the couple ideally should match. Yes, you heard me correctly. Opposites do not attract. If you are, if you end up being in a dyad or a couple with your diametrical opposite, with someone who doesn't share your values, with someone whose behavior grates on your nerves, the relationship will not last for long. If you can't reach an understanding regarding certain beliefs, certain goals in life, regarding what's appropriate and what is not, your relationship will not survive. Opposites don't attract, or if they do, it's a seriously bad idea. Attachment styles, like everything else, should match. Your values should match. Your beliefs should match. Your life goals should match. The stage in life that you're in should match. And your attachment styles should match. So attachment style has nothing to do with mate selection. In pair, it should inform mate selection. In other words, when you select a mate, you'd better select someone whose attachment style matches yours. But attachment style is not mate selection, nor is it an integral part of mate selection, actually. Impaired ma mate selection means that you keep choosing the wrong partners, and then you keep going on to having horrible relationships. Freud called it repetition compulsion, Adler called it diathesis. These are very old ideas, and this is the core problem, choosing the wrong partner repeatedly, consistently, and very often the same type. And so it is typically the outcome of bad parental programming. Attachment styles uh, form, are fostered by, engendered in childhood and adolescence. You, are, you witness an attachment between your parents and then you emulate it somehow. The attachment between you and your parents is a major influence. If it is bad, if it is dysfunctional, you're likely to develop a dysfunctional attachment style, an insecure attachment style. In our most modern approach to attachment, we divide all attachment styles to two groups, secure and insecure. Most insecure attachment styles are avoidant. Even someone with anxious ambivalent and anxious ambivalent attachment style is still avoidant. An anxious ambivalent attachment style leads to avoidance. This kind of person avoids relationship and intimacy, destroys relationships and intimacy because of anxieties and doubts including self-doubts. So we have secure and insecure, avoidant attachment styles. These are the two families. And the, and the attachment style informs, may inform mate selection in an ideal world, but very, very often doesn't. So mate selection is an autonomous process. It has to do with archetypes in a way, it has to do with the um, inter internalization and introjection of parental figures and other influential role models, including peers. So mate selection is also influenced by evolutionary considerations. For example, women are more likely to choose mates who can provide for them. That's a fact. That's not mis misogynism. And it's not sexism. It's supported by every single study in the field. Similarly, men are more likely to choose good-looking younger women. That's also a fact. I'm sorry. Chauvinism is a fact, regrettably, a scientific one. And so mate selection is focused around modeling, around types, around archetypes, around economic exigencies, around evolutionary considerations. Mate selection has very little to do with attachment style. Attachment style comes into play much later. If you are very, very self-aware, if you are educated in psychology, and of course, if you listen to lectures 
by Professor Dr. Sambakni, you would know to choose your mate based on your, on your attachment style, but most people don't, as my viewership numbers show. My contribution to this field was to suggest the addition of what I called, or what I call, the flat attachment style. Everyone has an attachment style, but some people have flat attachment. They are incapable of any kind of bonding or any kind of relatedness to other people at all. Flat attachers regard other people as utterly interchangeable, disposable, replaceable, and dispensable. Other people are objects, other people are functions, and flat attachers don't attach to objects and functions. Actually, very few of us do. When a relationship is over, people go through a period of latency, mourning or grieving the defunct bond, what could have been, and processing the grief. And then there are withdrawal symptoms associated with a breakup. But the flat attacher has no latency. He or she transition instantaneously, smoothly, abruptly, and seamlessly from one insignificant other to the next target. They don't grieve, they don't mourn, they don't withdraw, they don't avoid, they don't reconsider, they don't analyze, they don't seek closure, they simply move on. They fully substitute, and fully substitute a newly found beau, or lover, or mate, or intimate partner, in quote unquote, or spouse for the discarded one. They discard you, and they move on to your replacement. The discarded person is considered the equivalent of an expired product, something that is, whose shelf life is over, something, someone who is no longer useful. And so it's easy for them to move on because they're focused on goals. In many respects, flat attachers are a bit psychopathic. Indeed, many narcissists and almost all psychopaths are flat attachers. Borderlines, on the other hand, tend to sexualize attachment. As far as a borderline is concerned, sex and attractiveness are proof of attachment. Sex as we as we is abandonment anxiety. <clears throat> sex reduces, ameliorates, and mitigates the borderline's separation insecurity. She forces and prompts her partner to tell her how attractive she is, how amazing, how unique, how irresistibly sexy. That's her way of kind of testing the waters. Do you still love me? Are you going to abandon me? Am I going to be rejected by you? And of course, attachment has nothing to do with intimacy. Intimacy has little to do with emotions. Emotions don't have much to do with sex. Sex doesn't have to do anything with mate selection or has very little to do with mate selection, etc., etc., etc. This is a god-awful confusion. Confusing this, even in scholarly literature, has led to the blaring of lines and to completely wrong consequences and conclusions. Most of the field of gender study, studies is founded on these misperceptions, misapprehensions, and utter conflations and confusions. A lot of sexology is similarly found, founded on these um, wrong, simply wrong uh, pseudo facts and wishful thinking. We need to look, we need to take a hard, long, cold look at the realities of life and how men and women make choices, mate selection choices, sexual choices, uh, attachment choices. Attach attachment style is considered to be the hand of God unalterable. And indeed, it's very difficult to change one's attachment, attachment style. It's lifelong, it's throughout the lifespan, but it involves choices. While you can't control your attachment style, you can control your behavior and you can modify it. So to conflate attachment style with sexuality, for example, leads to disastrous consequences. To conflate, to conflate sexuality with intimacy similarly degrades intimacy, reduces it, 
into a physical release or physiological state to to confuse or mix emotions and in intimacy renders many intimate situations impossible beyond the pale and wrong while actually intimacy is always good there's no single situation of intimacy that involves intimacy and that is wrong for you and yet we avoid many intimate situations because we perceive them to be somehow unethical socially unacceptable etc and this is because we associate intimacy with sex and we associate intimacy with emotions and many emotions are forbidden for example you're not supposed to love anyone besides your spouse you're not supposed to have sex with anyone besides your spouse if you are in a monogamy or an exclusive relationship etc etc these are all confusions this is all um, a salad <laughs> and it borders on a word salad to borrow a phrase from the study of schizophrenia okay I want to read to you something I want to read to you a comment by Lynn Shaw it was posted today and it captured my attention and my eye as I think it's brilliantly written and encapsulates many of the insights in modern psychology she, she wrote vulnerable women revisit to punish themselves to bask in the dangerous non-specific place that is offered to them thinking that maybe they will be the one to tame the uncommitted it's not a heartfelt space it's possibly unresolved trauma there is no way in for change just a vast space that is decorated in maybes almost and could be's each time you self batter reducing yourself into yet another unnamed game starting from scratch each time as if nothing has been previously shared between the union the need for be for being seen goes unnoticed because there will, will always be another another that will tantalize with their veil of perfection as they search and search they leave debris excusing cold behavior as uncertainty the other is too much too demanding not quite evolved throughout the new search previous ties are never broken freedom doesn't come because the desire to remain bonded in any capacity doesn't allow others to move on grow letting go is not permitted and the means to draw you back in with ambiguous stories and bold statements means the link continues but it's a jaded link an unnecessary reunion that renders you stuck repeating and rehashing the nothingness that unveils no change no direction just enough to imagine or reimagine that there's something in the union that may flourish the freedom of letting go is rich in reality rich in realizing fully what is and what is not no longer do you hope or idealize you simply see feel and understand the subtleties that invisible thread that leaves you perpetually trapped breaking free says lynn is cathartic forgiving is freedom and then you you're released from tardy bonds and imagined connections reaching this point is when you experience self-love and eventual freedom a space where your once disorientated heart finally acknowledges authentic honesty and you lovingly begin to trust your worth again amazing extremely well written i could have said it myself <laughs> and i'm pissed at myself that i haven't okay shoshanim this was today's vignette look it up Today we are going to discuss attachment styles, attachment disorders, and attachment dysfunctions. In narcissists, psychopaths, borderlines, and histrionics, we are also going to study attachment styles and disorders in people diagnosed with CPTSD, complex trauma, 
complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And the reason is that people with CPTSD often display psychopathic and narcissistic behaviors and traits reactively and temporarily. So they also experience periods in which their attachment is disordered and dysfunctional. And we're going to study this as well. But we are going to go through a very peculiar path. We're going to start with a dead mother. And we're, then we're going to think about something we know, but we can never think of, etc., etc. So I promised you a fun ride in the Sam Vaknin theme park. Don't sign off after 10 minutes. You'll be missing all the fun. And um, at the end of this presentation, I hope you will have a handle, you'll get a grasp of how, how we interact with each other, how we relate to each other. Because attachment is not only about romantic relationships. We get attached to workplaces. We get attached to assignments. We get attached to objects. Attachment is a general attitude towards the world, a general emotional investment in something. Some people are very afraid to make this emotional investment. Some people make this investment and then run away. And some people make this investment and um, remain invested for life. So um, to understand how people interact with each other, interpersonal relationships, workplace relationships, we need to understand what makes them tick in terms of the ability to attach. My name is Sam Vaknin, and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. Um, I also wrote other books and e-books about personality disorders. I'm a professor of psychology in several universities. And without further ado, let's dive in. <clears throat> but before we do that, if you look at the upper part of your screen, you will see a navigation bar. I mean, on YouTube. You go to my channel, my YouTube channel, you look up, there's a navigation bar. To the right-hand side of the navigation bar, there is a word about. Next to about, Next to about, there's a magnifying glass. The magnifying glass is a search box. All you have to do is type a few keywords in the search box and the ever obliging YouTube will give you a series of recommended videos which include this keyword or relate to this keyword or however obliquely and tangentially uh, refer to this keyword. So I encourage you to use the search box in order to avoid my very blatant and rude responses to your questions. Okay, babies and babettes. I'm going to use now my bedroom voice. Q, mass exodus of screaming and puking ladies. And the reason I'm going to use my uh, bedroom voice is the moment you've all been waiting for. No, no, no. I'm going to keep my clothes on. And now, Q, collective sigh of relief. Few reckless women tiptoe warily back. I'm going to discuss today attachment styles and attachment dysfunctions, as I had promised. And there's an included bonus if you stay if you stay to listen long enough. There's an attachment style which you've never heard of before. And the reason you've never heard of before is because I invented it. In my lectures in various universities, when I teach att attachment, I teach it in a very peculiar way, which I haven't seen elsewhere, not online and not offline. And so if you bear with me, I will take you on a ride, the likes of which you are unlikely to encounter anywhere else. And of course, it all starts with childhood. Children grow among adults. This is a much neglected fact. Children grow among adults. When they look around them, they, they see people who are not like them. They see people who are chronologically advanced, hopefully mentally advanced, very different to them. They have to emulate and imitate these people in order to carry favor, in order to get food and shelter, in order to secure love and safety. They have to adhere to the tenets, beliefs, rules of conduct, and demands of these adults. And gradually, they realize that they have to become adults. And there's a process of becoming. 
And this process of becoming is dialectical. The child interacts with the adult and the adult interacts with the child. That's another much neglected aspect of growing up. It's not only children who have an impact, it's not only adults, sorry, who have an impact on children. Children have an impact on adults. It's a loop. It's a self-modifying, self-assembling loop. So children's thoughts about their caregivers, together with their thoughts about themselves, you know, when you put these two together, this is what we call the working model. Every child embarks on constructing a working model of the world very early on, we believe perhaps at age six months. And the working model that children construct includes elements which relate to their physical environment, elements which relate to adults in the environment, and elements which relate to themselves. For example, children often think about the question, do I deserve to get good care? Do I deserve to be loved? Am I entitled, entitled and worthy of safety and succor and comfort and affection? And the answers to these questions are very, very critical throughout life because the child has to develop a sense that he is a good, worthy object in order to function properly later in adult life. So working models of attachment are very critical. And the best types of working models, working models that work, they are founded on something called the safe base. The safe base is a parental figure usually, but could be any caregiver, a grandmother, in case, in case the parents are absent for some reason, a grandmother, a teacher, an adult role model. So, but usually it's, usually it's the mother. So a safe base is simply a mother that allows her child to separate from her, to individuate. Ironically, a safe base is a mother who pushes her child away, but pushes the child away compassionately, lovingly, empathically, encouragingly. She doesn't push the child away, away out of spite, out of insecurity, out of narcissistic injury, out of rage, out of hatred. She pushes, pushes the child away because she loves the child. And the one, she wants the child to become an autonomous, independent entity. It's very painful to the mother. It's very painful to the mother because mother and baby live in a symbiosis. They merge, they fuse. It's a codependent relationship, which could last two years even. But a mature mother pushes the child away. And when she pushes the child away, she constitutes a safe base, exactly like a military base. The child goes out, explores the world with the knowledge that he can always return to mommy, that mommy is there, that mommy is safe, that mommy is not going away anywhere, that mommy is not going to abandon him, not going to punish him, not going to punish him for becoming his own person with boundaries, with wishes, with a will, and with a grandiosity to explore the universe, because it takes a lot of grandiosity to explore the universe. It's a healthy kind of narcissism. It's what we call primary narcissism. It's a healthy type of grandiosity. It's the grandiosity that allows the child to take the immeasurable, uh, terrifying risk of abandoning mother, even if only for a second, even if only for a minute, and going out there. There's an issue of object constancy. When I look back, will mother still be there? When I want to return to her, will she accept, will she accept me? When I try to hug her leg, will she reject me? It's a lot, it's a huge gamble to leave mommy, to go away from mommy, to in a way push mommy away, to individuate, to separate is a traumatic gamble. And if the mother is the wrong kind, this first attempt, this first attempt at becoming you fails. And so the International Classification of Disorders, edition 10, and probably edition 11 is forthcoming, and the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, 
they discuss attachment in terms of situations where the child has attachment problems, attachment dysfunctions, either generally or to a specific attachment figure. But this is very narrow. It's also misleading, as we will see when I continue. It's also misleading, but it's also very narrow. And so there was a guy, um, um, scholar by the name of Andre, Andre Green. In 1983, he published an essay and he used the evocative, he used the evocative phrase, dead mother complex. He said that some mothers are dead. They are not, they are not dead in the sense that they are clinically dead, like no pulse and no, no brain activity. Although I know many mothers who are like that while alive. But they are dead in the sense that they are very uh, depressed. They're depressed. They're emotionally unavailable or they are narcissistic. They're too grandiose to take care of a child. They feel that the child had disrupted their lives, prevented them from reaching the pinnacle of their profession, ruined their lives in a way. So there is narcissistic rejection. There is depression. There is emotional unavailability because the mother herself has attachment disorder or attachment dysfunction. All these types of mothers, they are dead mothers. This is a contrast to Donald Winnicott's good enough mother. These are not good mothers and they are not enough, enough mothers. They, and the child, the only model that the child has of attachment, of emotions, of love, of relationship is a painful model, inordinately painful, existentially threatening, harrowing, terrorizing, horrifying model. It's a destructive process of identifying with a dead body, emotionally at least. This kind of mother is there and not there. And this mixed signal, this dual signal is intolerable. We, we do not tolerate, human beings don't tolerate well ambiguity and uncertainty. We try to disambiguate in a variety of ways much, most of which are destructive. And this kind of child exposed to a dead mother, he is exposed to a mother who is the epitome and quintessence of ambiguity. And she's depressed, and she's unavailable, she's rejecting, she's hurtful. And as Andre wrote, it's a mother who was initially, initially emotionally engaged with her child, but then switched off from emotional resonance to emotional detachment, perhaps under the influence of loss and mourning in her own family of origin. And when the child goes through this roller coaster, idealization, devaluation, when the child is, is unable to restore this warm, empathic, embracing, accepting, loving contact with the mother, he then, the child then internalizes a hard, unresponsive, emotional core. And this, of course, is a prerequisite to narcissism, because narcissism is a reaction to this internalization. Mother is hurtful. Mother used to love me, now she doesn't love me. I will never let anyone do this to me again. I will never put myself at the mercy of anyone who could cause, cause me such pain and really threaten my existence. Because when you're six months old or one year old or two year old and your mother is emotionally unavailable, distant, doesn't care about you, neglects you, you can die. It's life threatening. And in these kind of people, they become narcissistic later on in life and they are unable to form attachment. And we see this, for example, even in settings where attachment is minimal, like in therapy, where they can't go through the phase known as transference. They can't bond in some, in some way with the therapist. They can't even project their own emotions onto the therapist. They can't regard the therapist as a parental figure. Um, so there's no transference in treating such people. Dead mother syndrome is the acute form of this. And there are many dead mothers out there because we live in a narcissistic and psychopathic age. 
more and more people are technically narcissists and psychopaths. And these people, for some reason, procreate. They irresponsibly have children. And they raise these children as dead mothers and dead fathers. The mistake in attachment theories is to say that when a child doesn't have a safe base, when he has a dead mother, he runs away. He avoids. He runs, he develops avoidance strategies. He, he withdraws in, internally. He becomes narcissistic. He, he, and then he has like a, an imaginary friend, the false self, or a godlike entity, which is the false self. Or he, he withdraws and becomes a codependent, thereby suspending his own existence and merging with the mother figure. Or he withdraws and becomes psychopathic, antisocial, conduct disorder. It's known in children. It's, it's called conduct disorder. So the general, the general thrust of current attachment theories, starting with Mary Ainsworth and to these very days, Dina and, and others, the, the, uh, the thought is that when children are raised by the wrong kind of parents, by not good enough mothers, by dead mothers, they simply detach. And because they detach, they learn a coping strategy for life which is a coping strategy of detachment. And this is the part where I think attachment theories get it very wrong. They get it very wrong. If you, if you ever saw a baby crying inconsolably at the body of his dead mother, really dead mother, and if you ever watched the movie Psycho, Hitchcock's movie Psycho, where the son who, run, who was running the, the motel, Bates, keeps his mother's body mummified and continues to interact with her as though she were alive. If you've ever been exposed to these experiences, however vicariously, you would realize that the child does not run away from a dead mother, but learns to love her. Children love their mothers, whether they're alive, whether they're dead, whether they're good enough, whether they are vicious and atrocious, whether they're psychopathic, whether they're narcissistic, whether they're there, whether they're not there, emotionally available or not, rejecting or accepting. The child has no choice. He has to love mother. And he learns to love a dead mother. And when you fall in love with him and he claims to have fallen in love with you, he tries to convert you into a dead mother too. He wants you to play the role of his dead mother. He wants you to die and to be a mother. And this is as good a description, as good and concise a summation of relationships with narcissists that I've ever come across. The narcissist tries to do two things with his romantic intimate partner. He tries to kill her and he tries to convert her into a mother. He tries to recreate reconstruct and re-experience and reenact the unresolved conflict with a dead mother and the dead mother role is all yours but of course being in love with a dead object loving something dead is unthinkable so People with cluster B personality disorders, although they are capable of loving only dead people, dead mothers, dead mother substitutes, dead father substitutes, still, they don't dare to contemplate this. They're not aware of this. On the contrary, they lie to themselves. They're telling themselves, I'm trying to make her come alive. I'm reviving my intimate partner. I'm infusing her with life. I'm giving her thrills and adventures and color. I am, I am the engine of excitement in her life. She, when she's with me, she's much more alive than when she's not with me. So there is this self-delusional confabulation, this self-fallacious narrative that the narcissist 
and the psychopath and the borderline tell themselves, I'm not doing anything wrong to my partner. I'm not doing anything bad to my intimate partner. On the contrary, I'm Lazarus-like, raising him from the dead. And it's, of course, projection. <laughs> it's what happens. It's the intimate partner who raises the narcissist and the psychopath and the borderline from the dead because they are dead. Narcissists, psychopaths and borderlines are dead at the core. And they are dead at the core because they have internalized a dead mother, a dead object. But they don't dare to think about it. And instead what they do is called emotional thinking. They're not thinking with their heads. They're not thinking cognitively. But whenever they need to think about relationships, they think emotionally. They let their emotions control their cognitions, not the other way. And what they do, narcissists, psychopaths, borderlines, and victims of trauma, by the way, they cathect death and they cathect aggression. Now, what the hell is cathect, if you're asking? Cathect is emotionally invest. Cathexis is emotional investment. So they invest emotionally in death because their first emotional investment as children was in a dead mother a dead object so they know only how to invest in death and in dead people and in dead others and in dead intimacy in dead so they invest in death of course death is aggression aggression leads to death and death is aggressive by definition and this is called destrudo the opposite of libido libido is the force of life it comes from eros and destrudo is the force of death the force of destruction the force of aggression and it emanates from Thanatos, the force of, of death. And when we, in our current culture and civilization, we are emotionally invested in our smartphones, in our beautiful luxury cars, in our jobs, we are invested in inanimate, inanimate, inert material goods, materialism, is the ultimate consum consumerism is the ultimate expression of this trudeau of the force of death because objects are dead breaking news news alert all objects are dead i don't know if you realize that real objects physical objects the ones you can knock on they're dead and they are substitutes for the dead mother and so our culture and civilization encourage us to emotionally invest in dead things. And these people, narcissists, borderlines, psychopaths, histrionics, trauma victims, how do they react to this emotional investment in a dead object? The dead object cannot reciprocate, refuses to reciprocate, adamantly, insists on rejection, insists on humiliation, insists on mortification, injures you all the time, wounds you, the archaic wound, in, in the words of, of Freud. So it's a wounding process. It's death by a thousand cuts. So you withdraw. You love and you withdraw and you identify love with withdrawal. If love, then away. If love, then push if love then withdraw if love then not be to love is to not be love is an absence in the minds of these very very sick individuals it's an absence not a presence and the minute it becomes a presence it's very threatening existentially threatening because this presence is bound to be withdrawn and they are bound to feel pain the pain of ultimate rejection. They anticipate rejection. Borderlines, for example, anticipate abandonment, rejection, humiliation, and react to this anticipation, not to any real development. So they reframe reality in these terms. So these cluster B personalities, they can't afford to love because their first experience with love has been an experience of annihilation, annulment. They were not seen. It's critical to be seen when you're a child. 
It is through the gaze of the meaningful other, through the gaze of the primary object, the primary caregiver, through the gaze of mother, that you are defined. It is mother's gaze that constitutes and constructs your boundaries. It is through her that you realize that you are separate from her. She is the one. She is the agent, the agent of society. She's a socialization agent, but she's also the agent of the physical universe. And above all, she is your agent. She is the one who helps you become. She's the primary agent of becoming. And if you have a dead mother, you become a corpse, narcissists, psychopaths, borderlines, other walking dead. And so they, in an attempt to avoid a repeat, to avoid the repetition of the same type of painful relationship, they never allow themselves to truly love, to truly get emotionally invested. And they are very self-sufficient. They even self-parentify. They act as their own parents. And they're very autoerotic, sexually speaking. They gratify themselves sexually. Masturbation, pornography. And so to be able to love you, these people have to kill you first. It's like the famous joke. If I tell you the truth, I'll have to kill you. If I fall in love with you, I'll have to kill you. They have to kill. They have to kill the mother figure in order to love her. They snapshot you. They convert you into, into an inert photograph. They merge with you. They fuse with you. You disappear. You're digested. You're assimilated. You become an extension. These are various ways of killing you. Negating your existence. Annihilating you. And then when you're dead, when you're no more, when, you're, when, you, become, when you have become an absence, then they can love you, of course, because they're experts at loving dead mothers. And they identify love with absence. Um, their introjects, the introjects of their mother, their father, other figures, the inner voices, the representations, the avatars of these crucial adults, they are all non-interacting, dead, inert, mute, mute objects. The narcissist and the psychopath and the borderline and the histrionic and cluster B, they are the only, only people on earth whose introjects are essentially mute. They can't talk. They don't talk. They don't interact. They don't communicate. They're there. Snapshot. So they need to take away from you speech. They need to deny you the speech act. They need to prevent you from communicating because communication is pain. They need to fend you off and to, to fence you in and to stultify you, to ossify you and to mummify you and to fossilize you. And this way to own you and to control you because if you own and control someone, he cannot hurt you. She cannot hurt you. It's all about pain aversion and hurt aversion. And of course, this makes it impossible to distinguish internal objects from external objects. If your loved ones are inside you because you need to control them, micromanage them, if they're inside you, then they're internal. But they're also external. So internal is external. External is internal. The narcissist, the borderline, to a lesser extent, the psychopath, make very little distinction between internal and external objects. And in this particular sense, Otto Kernberg was right. These are people on the cusp, on the verge of psychosis, of a psychotic disorder. There was a guy called Christopher Bolas, B-O-L-L-A-S. And in the miracle years of the 1980s, which to my mind was the renaissance of psychology, or at least the psychodynamic and psychoanalytic schools of psychology. So in those miracle years, he came up with a concept called the unthought, the unthought known, unthought known. His work was based probably, we, we don't know for sure because he doesn't mention it, but probably on some comment that Freud reported in one of his endless 
a series of um, monographs and books and <laughs> articles. <laughs> Freud was a machine. So Freud um, reported that he had a patient and this patient told him, I've always known something, but I, I never thought of it. And Freud was kind of thunderstruck. He said, wait a minute, can you know something and not think of it ever? Is it possible to know, but not cognitively? Is it possible to be fully aware of some fact, some environment, some other person, and never to think of them? And so Christopher Bollas coined the phrase unthought known in the 1980s. And he said that these are experiences which in some way are known to the individual, but about which the individual is unable to think. I would add the individual is afraid to think. It's, it's, inhibit it's an in inhibition. It's inhibitory. And early schema schemata for interpreting the object world that preconsciously determine our subsequent life expectations are such, are an example of the unthought norm. So we're all born with schemata, with a kind of arrangement of cognitions, emotions, beliefs, and facts. So this schemata allows us to interpret the world, to interpret the object world. And they are preconscious and they determine what we expect of life, and they're an example of the unthought uh, known. So the unthought known is pre-verbal, unschematized, early experience. And of course, it can also be early trauma. Early trauma creates fact, create, it, early trauma creates facts, but these facts are so painful, so frightening, so devastating, that we know them, but we never think of them. They are fenced off, they are isolated, they are removed from consciousness. These unthought, these unthought knowns, they affect behavior. They do it unconsciously and preconsciously, but they affect behavior. But even though they affect behavior, they never, never access consciousness. Conscious thought has no access to these knowns. And yet they're known. And in therapy, very often, when we introduce the patient to the unthought known, the patient says, I've known this all along, but I never thought about it. And there's, of course, Beyond's idea of better elements. Beyond said that there are psychic experiences which people cannot process in any way by the mind. They are psychic. They are experiences. There's no denying them. There is knowledge that, that they had happened, but this knowledge is kept via a variety of defense mechanisms, probably, like repression, maybe, or denial. This knowledge is kept under the radar. The person cannot afford to think about these schemata or these experiences, and these traumas, because if he does, he will disintegrate. And Bolas, um, suggested that there are quite a few elements in the substance of the unthought known. He said that, for example, when you have persistent moods, uh, probably these moods preserve elementary but pre-schematized states of mind. He said that the moods are kind of reflections or reservoirs of these unthought knowns. And he said that very early in childhood, when the self interacts with the primary object, with the mother, for example. This interaction, if it's very emotionally loaded, for example, if you have a very painful interaction with your mother, if she's a dead mother, you will relegate it to the unthought known. Similarly, if you see something of great beauty, when you're a child mainly, pre-verbal, you can't verbalize it, you can't capture it with language, so you you kind of store it, it's a storage area, it's a warehouse. The unthought known is a warehouse of experiences and things and judgments and beliefs and values and, and, and facts and that you have a no conscious access to because they were all pre-verbal. Language is a barrier, prevents you from going there. And these are all parts of the unthought known. Now, narcissists, and psychopaths and borderlines and histrionics, they have a huge amount, huge number of unthought knowns. 
if you healthy normal people empathic people if you have i don't know 10 unthought norms a psychopath or a narcissist would have a hundred now this means this this is massive implications it means that the narcissist's interpersonal relationships they are recreations of his original relationship with the dead mother but because it's so devastating so painful so frightening so hurtful this whole thing the whole relationship will be processed through the unthought known let me try to explain it a bit the narcissist psychopaths borderline i mean they are born in a dysfunctional into into a dysfunctional family the primary caregiver mother in this case for example is one way or another abusive one way or another emotionally unavailable one way or another exploitative she parentifies the child she idolizes the child she instrumentalizes the child she abuses the child sexually or physically or verbally or psychologically or whatever there's something wrong going on there she is dead to the child the child still loves his mother even when she's dead so he learns that love is painful and that you can love only dead things and so this thought this this realization is so mind-boggling that he knows it but never thinks about it it becomes an unthought known and then when he meets the love of his life when he meets an intimate partner when he tries to develop a relationship have a family whatever he interacts with his intimate partner via the unthought known in other words he interacts with his partner recreating the original pattern of interaction with his dead mother, dysfunctional mother, sick mother, and he interacts with his intimate partner uh, not thinking about it. When you confront him and say, Do you know what? Do you, don't you see what you're doing? He says, No, what am I doing? He's utterly unaware. It's not a pretension, he's not faking it. He really is not aware. And it's also not a result of self-delusions or reframing, but a result of his inability. He cannot afford, he cannot allow himself to think of the known. He knows, but he doesn't dare go there. He doesn't dare to think about it. So, in order not to create a dissonance, not to create a conflict, not to force him to think, he kills you. He simply kills you. He renders you a dead mother. The minute you're a dead mother, you conform to the earlier pattern and there's no conflict. There's no dissonance and no risk that he will be forced to think about what he knows. No risk of bringing the unthought, the unthinkable from the unconscious to the conscious where it will create a massive conflict and may endanger the life of the cluster B personhood. So this is the sequence. Bad, early, bad, dysfunctional, early relationship. Suppression of this information. Knowing it, but not thinking about it. Then finding an intimate partner. Forcing her to recreate the early pattern by becoming a dead mother. So that what is known will not become thought. What is known will not become a cognition, will not generate overt, life-threatening conflict. Bolas, in his work, also linked the concept of the unthought known to Donald Winnicott's notion of the true self. So there is direct connection between Bolas's work, Winnicott's work, and narcissism, true self, false self, and so on. These are not just wild speculations on my part, but actually Bolas almost, almost touched upon it, almost went there. In uh, terms of system-centered therapy, um, in system-centered therapy, they make a distinction between what they call apprehensive knowing and comprehensive knowing. Apprehensive knowing is knowing, but not being able to verbalize what you know. Not being able to use language to communicate what you know to yourself and to others. And then there's comprehensive knowing. Comprehensive knowing is knowledge that you can communicate. To yourself and to others via language so we allow ourselves 
to formulate in words comprehensive knowledge or comprehensive knowing, but we don't allow ourselves access to apprehensive knowing. Perhaps because it's apprehensive, it's frightening, it's, it's threatening. And in, in therapy, the unthought known can become the subtext of the therapeutic interchange. The, the therapist becomes kind of a parent figure and he, he picks up the patient, he contains the patient. And the, the patient allows himself or herself to think, to think about the unknown via the therapist. So maybe we'll talk about it some other time. It's a process called projective identification. Back to attachment disorders. Uh, three prominent three prominent scholars of attachment disorders are Zina, Lieberman, and Boris. And uh, they suggested that attachment disorders start in childhood, which I agree. And they said that children um, who don't have, who did not have the opportunity to form an attachment, or were children who had a distorted relationship with a parental figure, or when an existing attachment was, for some reason, abruptly disrupted. In these three cases, there's an attachment disorder. And they use the, the term, disorder of attachment. It's when a young child doesn't seem to bond with or attach to any particular adult caregiver. And so these kind of children are indiscriminately uh, sociable. They approach all the adults and they sometimes approach total strangers and they're very cute and very sociable and they ask for love and they ask for compassion and affection and they ask to be comforted but they do this not with mother specifically not with father grandmother or grandfather but they approach any other wherever so there is a promiscuity it's a promiscuous sociability promiscuous behavior and it's a disorder of attach attachment and these, as I said, are children who didn't have the opportunity to form an attachment with a specific figure, as the DSM says, or whether there's a distorted relationship or existing attachment has been disrupted. So some children react by becoming promiscuous. They attach to any adult, and others react exactly the opposite. They withdraw emotionally. They fail to seek comfort from anyone, any adult. And so very often we mistake these children for shy children and say, oh, he's shy. This is not shyness. This is extreme pain aversion, extreme aversion to hurt. The child totally identifies any attempt at an interaction with an adult with life-threatening pain and hurt and abandonment and neglect and rejection and humiliation, a total threat of disintegration. So these children withdraw emotionally and fail to interact. And this is this is reminiscent of reactive attachment disorder. Um, because in reactive attachment disorder we have inhibited and disinhibited forms. Disinhibited forms are children who approach any adult for attachment, and inhibited forms are children who approach no adult for attachment. Now Boris and Zina describe a condition that they call secure base distortion. Secure base distortion is when the child does have uh, someone, a mother, a father, a grandmother, a grandfather, some caregiver, teacher, and he prefers this familiar figure, but the relationship with this figure is such that actually the adult does not provide the child with safety. When the child starts to explore the environment grandiosely, this kind of adult does not encourage the exploration and does not provide a safe base, does not broadcast to the child, go ahead, find yourself, find the world. I will be here when you return. I'll be here when you need me. On the contrary, the broadcast or the transmission is, is opposite, is who do you think you are? What are you doing? You're hurting me. Um, you don't love mommy anymore. Uh, you are impudent, insolent, uh, you are impertinent, you, you, misbe you are misbehaving, you are impolite, etc. Et so these are all inhibitory messages, messages that inhibit, prevent the child from exploring the world. And such children, they don't know what to do. 
and many of them are disinhibitory. They, they cling to any adult. They endanger themselves. They are excessively compliant, submissive. Or they try to become a parent because they don't have a parent. They try to become a parent and they try to parent themselves and even to parent the adult or even to punish the adult as a parent. So the, 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 these children are in total mess, total confusion as to roles, roles, who they can trust and how they should function once there is an interaction, which implies directly or indirectly some type of attachment. And Boris and Zina discuss a lot what they call disrupted attachment. Disrupted attachment is any abrupt separation or loss of a familiar figure, a mother, a father, uh, to, to whom the child is attached. So the child gets attached and then suddenly this figure is gone. It's gone because it died. It's gone because of a divorce. It's gone because it's lo lost interest in the child. It's gone because there's a new sibling, a newborn, and the, the attention of the parent is totally diverted um, to the newborn and the, the parent abandons and neglects the firstborn or the previous child. And so whenever there's a process of devaluation after idealization or after idolizing, as I mentioned, sibling rivalry, yes, the child perceives such abrupt absence as rejection. So even if the parent has to travel, they, it, it's perceived by the child as abandonment, abandonment and rejection, essential rejection, rejection of his essence, of who he is. So the child, the child decides that he is not worthy of love, not worthy of object constancy, not worthy of the parent being there for him, not worthy of safety. In other words, a bad object. As the child becomes an adult, he will try to sustain this self-image because it's his comfort zone. And a promiscuous child will become a promiscuous adult. An inhibited child will become an inhibited adult. And a child who had lost, had lost an attachment figure for whatever reason, a child who has been devalued, a child who has been dumped, a child who has been neglected and abandoned and humiliated and rejected, or just, you know, let go. This kind of child will try to recreate this in his intimate relationships. He will try to force his intimate partner via projective identification to play this role of the dysfunctional, not good enough dead mother. The young child's reaction to such a loss is, is grief. It's exactly grief, exactly the same, the five stages of grief des described by the Swiss American psychologist, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. The child protests. He cries, he searches for the attachment figure. Then the child is depressed, he is desperate, he is sad, he withdraws from communication and play, he detaches from the original relationship and gradually, very very gradually, he accepts. He accepts that the attachment figure, mother for example, is gone and he resumes gradually, slowly and usually dysfunctionally, social and play activities. Scholars such as Daniel Schechter and Erika Wilhelm, they have shown a relationship between maternal uh, PTSD uh, and secure base distortion. In other words, um, when the mother is violent, physically abusive, or even worse, sexually abusive, it creates a safe base distortion. And the child becomes reckless. He develops separation anxiety hypervigilance and role reversal and if this sounds familiar it's because these are elements of borderline personality disorder. Fraley and, and Shaver, these are two scholars, they describe the central propositions of attachment in adults. They, say, they said that all attachment in adults recreates the behavioral dynamics of infant and caregiver. In other words, adult relationships are nothing but a repeat, a replay, a reenactment of childhood relationships. When we observe individual differences um, in during childhood, these differences will be preserved to adulthood. Actually, we, we have learned that attachment styles are pretty stable um, throughout the lifespan. 
and only in 20% of cases, attachment styles are mildly modified. In 80% of cases, attachment styles, which are usually determined by age 2 to 6, the formative years, attachment styles survive lifelong. Individual differences in, in adult attachment behavior, they are reflections of expectations and beliefs people have formed about themselves and about close relationships. And these expectations have to do with attachment history. The working models that we started with, if you remember, we all build working models about ourselves, about other people. And these working models are stable and they reflect early caregiving experiences. And so romantic love involves the interplay of attachment, caregiving, intimacy, and the attachment part is actually unalterable, immutable. And Rhodes and, uh, Rhodes and uh, Simpson, they, they suggested that um, biology is involved somehow. It's biology that, that propels children to form attachment with caregivers, and it's shaped by interpersonal experiences. And they said that experiences in early relationships, they create the internal working model, and they create the attachment style, and these systematically affect attachment relationships. And the attachment orientations of adult caregivers influence the attachment bond of their children. This is how crucial it is to be good parents. Working models and attachment orientations are relatively stable over time. They are impervious to changes, very dangerous. Some forms of psychological maladjustment, some clinical disorders, including cluster B personality disorders, they are attributable in big part to the effects of insecure working models, insecure attachment styles. So biology drives attachments, but attachment is largely shaped by learning experiences. And, in, and it depends crucially on expectations and beliefs that people have about their relationships. And these expectations and beliefs come from internal working models. These internal working models, they guide relationship behaviors. They are relatively stable, as we said, and they hark back to childhood. Individual differences in attachment contribute positively or negatively to mental health. So we have four main types of attachment uh, in adults. Now it's very crucial because people make the most god-awful mess confusing childhood attachment styles with adult attachment styles. They are not the same. In adults we have secure, anxious, preoccupied, dismissive avoidant and fearful avoidant attachment styles. And to this, I've added a, a fifth one, my contribution, my attempted contribution, a flat attachment style. So Cindy Hazen and Philip Shaver, they observed that interactions between adults share similarities to interactions between children and caregivers as the issue of closeness, comfort versus anxiety or loneliness. And there's a, even in adult relationships, there's an issue of secure base. Secure base. You want to know that you can trust your intimate partner, that she will be there for you, that you have somewhere to come back to. And it helps you face the surprises, the opportunities, challenges. It helps you face life. Everyone has an attachment style. Now, I would like to talk a bit about my, my contribution or attempted contribution to attachment theory. I suggest to introduce a fifth, a fifth style. I'm going to discuss each of the other four later, but I'm, I try to, I'm trying to introduce a fifth one called flat attachment. These are people who are, who are incapable of any kind of bonding and any kind of relatedness at all. Flat attachers regard other people as utterly interchangeable, replaceable, and dispensable objects or functions. When a relationship is over, people go through a period of latency. They mourn the defunct bond. They process the grief. And there are withdrawal symptoms associated with a the breakup. They go cold turkey, if you wish. Flat attaches are different. They react to the disintegration of even the most meaningful or primary relationships by becoming defiant and becoming mad rather than heartbroken and sad. They are mad, not sad. The flat attacher transition, transitions instantaneously, smoothly, abruptly, and seamlessly from one insignificant other to the next target. She fully substitutes a newly found ball 
lover, mate, or intimate partner, for the discarded one, whose usefulness is expired, for whatever reason. Many narcissists, and almost all psychopaths, are actually flat attachers. In 1995, I coined the phrase, idealize, devalue, and discard. And I should have added idealize, devalue, discard, and replace. Flat attachment is often confused and conflated with commitment phobia, the fear of committing to a joint future. But it's different. Flat attachers are constitutionally incapable of bonding with other people. Commitment phobes anticipate with anxiety the expectations that their attachments to others and, and gender. So commitment phobes are um, terrified of, of the expectations of their intimate partners and the emotional and pragmatic outcomes of, of liaisons, of intimate relationships. They are simply in a state of anxiety. Flat attachers have no anxiety. They simply don't bond. They don't attach. And then don't give a hoot about your expectation. Commitment phobes are avoidant. They are not emotionally vacuous, on the contrary. They have very strong emotions. Flat attachers are emotionally not there. They're emotionally absent. Intimacy increases with time together. But the more time you spend with a narcissist or with a flat attacher, the less intimate you get. I call this effect reversed intimacy. It's the outcome of the fact that one is interacting with the narcissist's false self. It's a piece of grandiose fiction, a placeholder where an entire person should have been. Traumatized victims of narcissistic abuse have learned to emulate the narcissist, himself in a post-traumatic state, as you know. They, they try to slap a label on their tormentor and then to ignore him and relate only to the label, total labeling. Where no intimacy is involved, of course, where no intimacy is possible, stereotypes take over. So this was this is my attempted contribution. I suggest that there's a fifth style. Because all the other four styles that we have for adult attachment, they assume some kind of interplay. They assume some kind of need for attachment that is either frustrated or avoided, or, but flat attachers don't have a need to bond or to attach nor do they have the capacity to do it. The secure attachment style in adults corresponds to the secure attachment style in children. The anxious preoccupied attachment style in adults correspond to the anxious ambivalent attachment style in children. The dismissive avoidant attachment style and the fearful avoidant attachment style in adults are separate and distinct, but in children they are one, and it's called avoidant attachment style. So children have a single avoidant attachment style, while adults have dismissive avoidant or fearful avoidant. So there were two scholars, but there are two scholars, Bartholomew and Horowitz. Bartholomew and Horowitz, together with uh, Pietro Monaco and Barrett, they created all kinds of tables and models of attachment. And Bartholomew and Horowitz proposed that working models consist of two parts. The first part of the working model deals with thoughts about oneself. The other part of the model deals with thoughts about other people. And they propose that a person's thoughts about the self are generally positive or generally negative. And the same applies to, person, to, people, to someone's thoughts about others. So you can be positive about yourself or negative about yourself. You can be positive about other people or negative about other people. And so what you do, you can construct a table, which is exactly what Bartholomew and Horowitz have done. They created a table of relationship between attachment styles, self-esteem, and sociability. And they said that if your sociability is positive and your self-esteem is positive, you have a secure attachment style. If your sociability is, is uh, positive and your self-esteem is negative, you have an anxious, preoccupied attachment style. If your sociability is negative and your self-esteem is positive, you would have a dismissive avoidant attachment style. And if, you've, if both are negative, you will have a fearful avoidant attachment style. And so the secure and dismissive attachment styles are associated with higher self-esteem compared with anxious and fearful attachment styles. And this corresponds to the distinction between positive and negative thoughts about the self in working models. The secure and anxious attachment styles 
are associated with higher sociability. Dismissive and fearful attachment styles are less sociable people. And this corresponds, of course, to the distinction between positive and negative thoughts about other people in working models. But narcissists, psychopaths, borderlines, victims of trauma, complex trauma, and histrionics, they have only insecure attachment styles. We'll start with the first one, anxious, preoccupied. The anxious, preoccupied attachment style characterizes the compensatory narcissist, the inverted narcissist, other covert narcissists, borderline personality disorder, and dependent personality disorder, colloquially known as codependent. The anxious, preoccupied attachment style is people who have a negative view of the self, but they have a positive view of others. If you think of the compensatory, uh, if you think of the borderline, for example, she has a negative view of herself, usually, but she has a positive view of her intimate partner. She wants her intimate partner to help her to regulate her internal environment. She believes in the intimate partner's omnipotence. That's why the borderline is a perfect match for the narcissist, because she encourages his grandiosity. She agrees with it. She wants him to be grandiose. She wants him to be godlike, because she expects him to do miracles. She expects him to give her inner peace. She expects him to reduce the lability of her moods and to regulate her emotions. So the borderline is a positive view of others. Similarly, the covert, the covert narcissist he has a very negative view of himself. He is shy, he is fragile, he is vulnerable, but he has a positive view of others. In the case of an inverted narcissist, he has a positive view of the overt narcissist she is with. Again, there is a lot of magical thinking here because they expect their intimate partners to do, to, to do miracles, to, to do the impossible, to accomplish the impossible. They expect their intimate partners to make life tolerable for them, to regulate both their internal environment and their external environment. The inverted narcissist basks in the glory and accomplishments of her overt partner. The covert narcissist undermines and manipulates uh, his intimate partner in order to self-regulate and to obtain uh, her, his or her own goals. And this kind of people say, I want to be completely emotionally intimate with others, but I often find that others are reluctant to get as close to me as I would like. Or they say, I'm uncomfortable being without close relationships, but I sometimes worry that others don't value me as much as I value them. And they, this kind of attachment, the anxious preoccupied attachment, they, these people want intimacy, they crave intimacy. They seek high level of intimacy, approval and responsiveness from their attachment figure. They value intimacy to an extent that they become overly dependent on the attachment figure because they consider the attachment figure the only source of intimacy. Mini break. And these people feel a sense of anxiousness. And this anxiety recedes only when they are in contact with the attachment figure. In a way, codependency can be easily reconceived as an anxiety disorder. These people doubt their worth as people. They blame themselves for the attachment figure's lack of responsiveness. They have autoplastic defenses. They, they feel guilt. They feel shame. They feel ego egodystonic. They feel unease. They feel discomfort. They feel apprehension. They feel anxiety. These are neurotic defenses. These people are essentially what used to be called neurotics. And this dependence and idealization of the intimate partner, they render the attachment figure the sole source of solace and comfort and succor. The dependence is, is total upon the source of intimacy. And this the intimate partner serves as an anxiolytic, an anxiety-reducing medication. They self-medicate. These people, borderlines, coverts, inverted narcissists, they self-codependence, they self-medicate with an intimate partner. And they exhibit high levels of emotional expressiveness, emotional dysregulation, worry, impulsivity. Um, and it easily and seamlessly can glide 
into psychopathic or histrionic territory. So there is a lot of back and forth and a lot of switching, which is very reminiscent of multiple personality, by the way. They are like self-states that they switch between. So a borderline can easily become secondary psychopath. And the change is so pronounced and so amazing and so startling that you feel that this person is possessed, taken over by another entity, unrelated to the original. And so there's a lot of this switching going on. And this switching is triggered by perceived, perceived rejection, humiliation, neglect, abandonment, being ignored by the intimate partner. The second type of insecure attachment style is dismissive avoidant. It characterizes the overt narcissist and the primary psychopath. A dismissive avoidant attachment style is when you possess a positive view of yourself and a negative view of others. When you, for example, hold other people in contempt, when you devalue others, when you consider them inferior to you. And this kind of people say, I'm comfortable without close emotional relationships. It is important to me to feel independent and self-sufficient. I prefer to not depend on others or to have others depend on me. And these people desire a high level of independence. They are fiercely independent. Independence is their autonomy, self-autonomy, self-agency, self-efficacy, is their religion, their ideology. And the desire to attain these goals of independence, it's like it, it translates into avoidance of attachment. They avoid all types of attachment whatsoever. We are not talking only in romantic relationships, but for example, they can't hold a job. They are itinerant. They don't live in one place for long. They move around. They are rootless, rootless, like R-O-O-T, less. They have no roots and they are ruthless in pursuit of rootlessness. They view themselves as self-sufficient, invulnerable. And this blends into, sustains and buttresses their grandiosity, their grandiosity is founded on self-containment, self-sufficiency, independence, autonomy, self-efficacy, the ability to extract by force if needed beneficial outcomes from the environment, including the human environment. And they are invulnerable. And, and because they want to remain invulnerable, they perceive attachment as a weakness, as a vulnerability, as a chink in the armor. And they don't want to be closely associated with others. They deny that they need close relationship. And they view close relationship as unimportant in the best case, if not, you know, outright weak and stupid. And they seek less intimacy with attachments, with attachment figures. They often view um, their intimate partners less positively than they view themselves. They tend much more to devalue others, including their intimate partners. And they have a defensive character. It's, it's actually a defense. The irony is that these people are actually highly insecure. That's why we call it an insecure attachment style. The dismissive avoidant attachment style, they, they don't, they're not really um, heroic or victorious or impermeable or invulnerable. They are suppressing and hiding their feelings. Remember the unthought non? They, they can't afford to get in touch with their emotions. They can't afford to know what had really happened to them. They tend to deal with rejection by distancing themselves from the sources of rejection. And they tend to do this not only when actual rejection is happening, but also when they predict or anticipate rejection, when they misinterpret some behaviors as rejection. And they tend to misinterpret most behaviors as rejection. Their attachments are very fragile. And they are very fragile because they are fragile. They are fearful. They are unresolved. And so this leads to the next, to the next uh, attachment style, which is fearful, fearful avoidant attachment style. This characterizes some borderlines, compensatory narcissists, and secondary psychopaths. The fearful, avoidant, unresolved, cannot classify attachment patterns. They are people who have unstable, fluctuating and of view of themselves an unstable fluctuating view of others. So they tend to idealize, idealize and devalue themselves as they idealize and devalue others. By the way, everything in the psychology of cluster B personality disorder 
has a self dimension and an other dimension. Narcissistic supply, there is self provision of narcissistic supply. But the narcissist sometimes can provide himself with supply. There is uh, self devaluation, there is self idealization. I, I call this process co idealization. As the narcissist idealizes his partner, he's actually idealizing himself. If he's deserving of such an ideal, perfect, brilliant, most beautiful partner, then he himself is perfect. So everything has, in these people with the fearful avoidant attachment style, they fluctuate, they're labile, they're not stable, they're not regulated. Their view of themselves and view of others is, is fluctuating. And these are people usually with losses or massive traumas, including, for example, sexual abuse in childhood and, and adolescence. And these people say, I'm somewhat uncomfortable getting close to others. I want emotionally close relationships, but I find it difficult to completely trust others or to depend on others. I sometimes worry that I would be hurt if I allow myself to become too close to other people. So they tend to, to feel uncomfortable with emotional closeness. They, they, they feel ill at ease when they're loved. When someone tries to get intimate with them, they become aggressive. Rejection, rejecting and pushing away. And these are mixed feelings, mixed signals, mixed messages. It could drive you, it's crazy making, drive, you, drive their intimate partners insane. Because they have unconscious negative views about themselves and about their attachments. They view themselves as unworthy of responsiveness from their attachments. They say, I'm a bad object, can't you see? I'm unworthy. Why do you give me love? If you give me love, either you're blind and stupid or you are cunning and manipulative. These are the only two reasons to give me love. You can see that I'm damaged goods. You can see I'm broken and defective and dysfunctional. And yet you give me love. Something is wrong with you. Or you're doing this for a purpose. There's some hidden agenda. There's some ulterior motive. They don't trust the intentions of their attachments. And similar to the dismissive avoidant attachment style. People with a fearful avoidant attachment style. They seek less intimacy from attachments. They suppress, deny their feelings, and they are much less comfortable expressing affection and love. And finally, Baldwin and others, they've applied the theory of relational schemas to working models of attachment. This relational schema is a scheme uh, which contains information about the way the attachment figure regularly interact with, with each other. So a relational schema is a schema which pertains to a relationship. And for each pattern of interaction, uh, the schema contains information about the self, information about the attachment, and information about the way the interaction usually unfolds. So the relational schema has a predictive value, a prognosticating value. In other words, if you have a schema in your head as to how you're interacting with your intimate partner, you this schema tells you something about yourself, tells you something about the relationship, tells you something about your partner, and tells you a lot about how your partner is likely to react to your signals, to your advances, and to your attempts to be close. Relational schemas help us to guide behaviors and relationships because they allow people to anticipate, to predict, to plan for the responses of the intimate partner. In a relational schema is simply a lot of experience from which we derive heuristically a law, a rule. It is a, this is a rule-based system, a rule of thumb, if you wish, heuristic rule, based on experiences. Relational schemas uh, are, are therefore in the, in the shape of if-then. If I try to kiss her, she will kiss me back. If I try to hug her, she will reject me. If I try to have sex with her, she will have sex with another man. So, you see, I have a morbid mind. So, uh, the relational schema kind of augments and improves the working model. Because the working model is static. Working model says, this is who you are, or this is who you think you are. This is who you think other people are. And the relational schema adds to this by saying, this is who you think you are, this is who you think other people are, and this is what, what you think will happen if you do this and this. People with attachment styles were less, less li uh, likely to um, 
people with various attachment styles were less likely to operate outside the relational schema. In other words, relational schema exist in each and every one of us. Differences in attachment styles actually reflect differences in relational schema. When you have a relational schema, it dictates your behaviors. You, you're trying to avoid rejection. You're trying to avoid pain. You're trying to avoid hurt. There are some things you will not do. You know that you will be reciprocated. You know that you will receive pleasant experiences and pleasant feedback. So you're drawn to do this. So it's positive and negative reinforcements to use behavior, behaviorist theories. Relational schema incorporate information about positive and negative reinforcements. You will try to avoid negative responses. You will try to seek positive responses. And gradually it will shape the way, shape the way you attach to your intimate partner. Relational schemas involved in working models are organized into hierarchy. I will quote Baldwin. Baldwin said, a person may have a general working model of relationships, for instance, to the effect that other people tend to be only partially and unpredictably responsive to his needs. At a more specific level, this expectation will take different forms when considering different role relationships. For example, we will not have the same relationship with a customer as we will with a romantic partner. Within romantic relationships, expectations might then vary significantly, depending on the specific attachment, on the specific situation, or the specific needs being expressed. Baldwin, 1992. And so this hierarchy is three, three partite. There are three levels to this hierarchy. The highest level contains very general relational schema, schemas that apply to all relationships. These are general expectations about relationships, you know, all relationships, romantic, business, workplace, with parents, with children, with neighbors, with others, with strangers, and so on. The next level of the hierarchy contains relational schemas that apply to particular kinds of relationships. So you would have relational schemas that pertain to customers, relational schemas that pertain to bosses, relational schemas, schemas that pertain to your underlings and subordinates, relational schemas pertain to your parents, to your intimate partners, to your children, to your neighbors, to strangers you meet in a bar, etc. etc. These are that's the second level in the hierarchy of relational schemas. And it's a differentiated level, depending on the specific type of relationship. And the lowest level of the hierarchy contains relationship schemas that apply to specific relationships. Relationships with my this specific wife, with this specific intimate partner, with this specific boss, in this specific workplace right, right now. These are time-dependent relational schemas that are, of course, replaced. If you divorce your wife and marry another wife, you will have a totally different relational schema. Hopefully for you. <laughs> Pietro Monaco and Barrett wrote the following. From this perspective, people do not hold, do not hold a single set of working models of the self and of others. Rather, people hold a family of models that include at higher levels abstract rules or assumptions about attachment relationships and at lower levels information about specific relationships and events within relationships. These ideas also imply that working models are not a single entity, but are multifaceted representations in which information at one level need not be consistent with information at another level. In other words, for example, that's Pietro Monaco and Barrett, 2000. Um, for example, you can have on the second level, you can have a general relational scheme, a schema with regarding to, uh, with, with regard, which regards intimate relationships. So you have a general relational schema regarding intimate relationships, but on the third level, you have a relationship schema uh, 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 that pertains to your marriage. And the relational schema that pertains to your marriage could contradict completely the relational schema that, that pertains to intimate relationships. Why? Because your marriage is not intimate, is not functioning well. So evidence that general working models and relationship-specific working models are organized into hierarchy is abundant. And for example, I refer you to Overall, Fletcher, and Friesen. Okay, let's try to wrap it up. When you're securely attached, you look for support. And looking for support is your most effective coping strategy. You're not afraid of people. 
You believe people can help you. You believe they're good, essentially good. You believe they can provide you with what you need emotionally. So you go, you go looking out for them. That is secure attachment. When you have avoidant attachment, you tend to devalue the relationship and you tend to withdraw. When you have anxious attachment, you use emotionally focused coping strategies. You think emotionally and you pay more attention to experience distress. Uh, Pistole in 1996 studied anxious attachment in depth. In 96, 95. So securely attached individuals have less negative overall emotional experience than insecurely attached. We said it before. Their early childhood was much happier and they had a safe base. And there are many studies, including recent studies, for example, Fox in uh, Tukunaga that show that anxious and avoidant attachments predict, predict behaviors such as stalking. When you're anxious, when you're avoidant, you tend to act antisocially. You become psychopathic. And this is where we tie it in with victims of complex trauma, victims of CPTSD. Being exposed to multiple repetitive trauma can induce temporary anxious and avoidant attachment styles. For example, every trauma victim, every victim of narcissistic abuse will tell you how difficult it is for her to trust again, to date people again, to go on dates. She becomes avoidant. She becomes um, anxious. And these attachment styles encourage, encourage psychopathic and narcissistic behaviors and traits. And for example, there's a, a, a huge correlation between anxious and avoidant attachment style and behaviors such as stalking. Now, ironically, stalking is about um, being uh, committed. The, uh, uh, stalking means commitment. The stalker is committed to you. A stalker is attached to you. And the anxious person is committed to you. He's anxious because he's committed. He's afraid to be rejected. And the avoidant person is negatively uh, attached to you in a way. He is attached via his avoidance. He is attached to his avoidance. So, ironically, these behaviors actually reflect commitment and variations of attachment. And so, attachment, commitment, trauma, pain, hurt, they are all one complex. You can organize them in a relational schema. You can organize them in an internal working model. It doesn't it doesn't really matter what you call it. it. doesn't matter. Psychopathic and narcissistic behaviors are induced by distress and by pain and by hurt and by trauma. These are reactions. These are defense mechanisms. These are attempts to reassert control, uh, attempts to be seen, to become visible, attempts to diffuse or reduce and ameliorate anxiety, self-medication sometimes with recklessness or with impulsivity or with antisocial conduct. These are coping mechanisms. And what people don't realize is that these coping mechanisms actually increase anxiety, increase distress. And that's why we consider them dysfunctional. In psychology, there's no value judgment, no morality. We don't say to be a psychopath is bad. It's not okay. It's evil. Well, YouTubers do that. But academics don't. What we are concerned with, is it working? Is, is it functional? Does it fulfill the role? Does it, does it do things? Does it accomplish things? And to become a psychopath and a narcissist because you've been traumatized, or you've been hurt, or you're anxious, or you're avoidant, this is dysfunctional because we have proven con conclusively in many studies that psychopathic and narcissistic and borderline strategies, coping strategies, defiance, impulsivity, contumaciousness, secondary psychopathy, all these things, they increase distress, they enhance anxiety, they're not, they don't work. There's a lot more to narcissists and psychopaths and borderlines than the disorders. Uh, I started my work 25 years ago as a pioneer. And and my work, to some extent, has been misunderstood because people tend to reduce, reduce the narcissist to a figment 
to his pathology. They ignore the person behind the persona. They ignore the core of the narcissistic nuclear meltdown of attachment. Lack of self faith lack of object constancy, fear of being loved and fear of loving. The need to love a dead mother because dead objects are fully controlled. Inanimate dead objects never betray you, never abandon you, never hurt you. And this renders any type of meaningful communication with the narcissist all but impossible and inefficacious because the narcissist's main strategy is absence. He absents himself and he wants to absent you and he wants to have an intimate relationship between two absences, a relationship between non one non-existence and another, between two voids, between an emptiness and a void. The borderline to a large extent is the same. The borderline is a failed narcissist, but still highly grandiose and has many, many narcissistic features. And the same with the psychopath, both primary and secondary. The variation is has to do with the existence of empathy and with the regulation of emotions or access to emotions. But these are variations on the theme. And the theme is that these people, as children, they were instructed, told, and encouraged to not exist. They were not seen. They were not allowed to become. They were, they were given permission to exist only as elements of the parent, attributes of the parent, dimensions of the parent, and instruments of the parent, or not at all. Love was conditioned on not being. It's a lesson that is impossible to eradicate because attachment styles are stable.